ready for the Planning and Community Development Committee meeting for Thursday, September 12, 2019. Call the meeting to order at 9.30 and acknowledge that we're meeting on the Seashell Nation traditional territory. Um, and welcome back, those of you who have been away and doing things during the summer. And uh, that if I forget your names when I'm sitting up here, because we haven't, we haven't seen each other for the last month. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, please. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, um, we may make a few mistakes as we get restarted and reused to meeting with the, with the board. So, um, first of all, we have the first item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. And before we do that, are there any additional items that anybody would like to add as new business? No. Yes, uh, Director McMahon? Okay, and Director Pratt? Uh, oops. Anything from this side of the table? Okay, thank you. So with those additions, could I have a motion, please, to adopt the agenda as amended? Uh, Director Pratt, Director McMahon, thank you. So all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have two delegations this morning. I'd like to welcome those who are here. Um, the first delegation is with the Wendy Francis, the executive director. To what may be involved uh, in putting our regional growth strategy together, time frames, uh, all the stakeholders that might be involved and that kind of thing, and just kind of talk about it. For the, oh, and, and vice chair uh, of the Sunshine Coast Community Foundation. No, okay. Oh, sorry. And Menji can't. She's not, Menji's not here with you? You came alone to Gibson's as well. <laughs> Nobody likes to travel with you. <laughs> okay. All right, please, Wendy, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the um, board for um, inviting us to be here. And uh, with apologies to <laughs> Darnalda, who's heard this twice, and Tom and, and Bill, who've heard this already, um, I'm here on behalf of the Sunshine Coast Community Foundation, and um, uh, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and how we're relevant to our community. The Sunshine Coast Community Foundation is a nonprofit society. We are a registered charity, and we're part of a network of nearly 200 community foundations across Canada. We help communities to thrive by pooling gifts of cash, which are donated by generous community members, and we invest them to generate earnings or interest. And each year we use those earnings to make grants to local charities that are addressing community needs. Most charities use uh, their donations from members and supporters to pay for their programs and operations, and each year they must raise enough donations to cover their annual budgets. Whereas the Community Foundation is different, unless a donor directs otherwise, we permanently invest 100% of the donations that we receive, and we use the earnings on those investments, both to fund our operations, but more importantly, to make grants to groups doing good work in the community. By spending only a portion of the earnings uh, on the donations that we invest, the pool of investments held by the Community Foundation has grown significantly, and we now steward more than $5 million that generates approximately $150,000 a year in grants that's returned to the community. The Community Foundation was created more than 15 years ago, and we began making grants in 2005, since then, we have injected more than $1 million into the community from Port Mellon to Egmont in the form of grants to support the good work of local charitable organizations. Donors come to us when they want to create a lasting impact. They can establish an endowment or a permanent fund that we invest and then advise us where they would like the earnings from that investment to flow. Uh, they can create a new endowment or they can make a gift to an existing endowment and we are now entrusted with the management of more than 60 permanently endowed funds. Some of our grants are automatically directed to 18 charities that have established endowments with us themselves or who are the beneficiaries of endowments established by donors. 
and other grants are given out at the discretion of the Board of Directors after a competitive process each spring. And still other grants are awarded on the recommendation of donors who act as advisors to endowments that they have created. The Foundation supports a wide variety of causes and initiatives and this list is not closed. So long as the recipient is a charity or other qualified recipient and the effort is directed towards improving life on the Sunshine Coast, the scope of projects that we can support is quite broad. Here are some examples of uh, grants that we have awarded recently to initiatives important to uh, life in the Sunshine Coast Regional District. So the new trail around Fair Lake, trail maintenance at Sargent's Bay Park, the new community garden at Roberts Creek uh, Elementary School, and new equipment and survival suits for the search and rescue team in Pender Harbor. Those are just a few examples of grants that we've given out in the last year or two. The Community Foundation regularly publishes reports called Vital Signs. And this is a community checkup based on statistical and survey information that looks at things like indicators of uh, health, housing, food security, and belonging, or community connection. We published our first vital science report in 2009. We repeated it in 2011 and 2014. And we published smaller updates like this in 2016 and 2017. In 2019, we will publish a 10-year retrospective issue of Vital Signs. That will be coming out in just a few weeks, looking at the trends in a number of key indicators that will show the direction that things are going in terms of the health of our community. And issues that repeatedly show up in these reports, these won't be a surprise to you, housing availability, affordability and homelessness, seniors' isolation and care, transportation issues, child care, and employment opportunities. As our communities on the coast grow, these issues are becoming increasingly challenging. The foundation works to address them by directing our grants to charities that are working to make our community healthy, healthier and a safer, more diverse, and inclusive place to live. And so uh, we're releasing our 2019 report on September 30th. It will be in the Coast Reporter on October 4th. And you can expect to see me again so sometime after that to talk to you about what we found in this year's report. I think there are some great opportunities for the foundation to work with the district. Municipalities are qualified recipients of grants, and so we can make grants to you either for your own uh, work in the community or we can flow through grants um, to this regional district to other uh, nonprofits on the coast. And we also look forward to collaborating with you to address some of these key issues, which we could form a partnership and work on some of these things together, and we'd very much look forward to that opportunity. Our board recently amended our grants policies such that we can now give larger multi-year grants, and that creates the opportunity for these kinds of collaborations. And of course, we would like the opportunity to apply for grants from the regional district as well. Um, just a note not to confuse us with uh, some other organizations on the coast that have a similar name. I find this um, quite often in my conversations with people. Uh, the Community Forest, also an important granting organization, but that's not us. Uh, Community Futures, um, important work uh, with um, entrepreneurial organizations in our community, but that's not us either. And the Community Services Society that provides a lot of important services to vulnerable communities. Um, they're a recipient of grants from us frequently, but that's not us either. So we are the Sunshine Coast Community Foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, please, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have now or invite you to contact me for further conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and, uh, and then thank you again for the work that the Foundation does. Um, kind of debating whether I put my own plug in here, but it, it's actually very important as an organization and very easy to get involved with. Um, back in um, about 10 years ago when my 
younger son, older son, actually graduated from Elphinstone High School. He was given several scholarships and and bursaries and things like that to carry on to university. And uh, he eventually graduated from the um, University of uh, NASCAD, uh, Nova Scotia University of, of uh, Art and Design. Um, and um, uh, my wife and I appreciated the support of the community for our son. Uh, and, and we then started an endowment with the uh, foundation. Uh, and it's for the Sunshine Coast Endowment for Visual Arts. And we now, through that single endowment, are able to give a $1,000 scholarship a year away to students interested in continuing arts and, and just paying back. And that's an important aspect of what we can do as a community. And anybody can start an endowment. I think there's a requirement for a $5,000 initial buy-in. Mm -hmm. But that generates the interest. The $5,000 we donate is still there, uh, as well as money we've added through the years. And uh, so that we're able to do that, and anybody can add to that. We didn't call it the Bill and Heather Beamish Endowment or anything else. We just called it the Endowment for Visual Arts. And so that as that grows, more and more students will have access to that as a scholarship purposes. And each year that's given away. This year, I believe, it went to a student at Chad. And, um, and sometimes it's two students, $500 each. But that's just how simple it is is an act of uh, generosity or kindness from our own community for individuals, and that's how they've got 60 endowments or 60 programs. Uh, so there's something to think about uh, to, to use the foundation. The foundation does great work, and every cent that's ever been donated to the foundation still exists because the foundation only uses the interest for donation purposes. And uh, the other opportunity, of course, is to... Um, leave funds in your will, and and my wife and I have also done that as well, sort of thing. So that, uh, so that, um, yeah. So that there are other ways, but uh, having having been there, and, and I speak as having been on the board of the foundation, so a little bit uh, probably biased in that uh, context. There are other ways to donate and give back to the community. So um, that being said, uh, any directors have any questions? Director uh, Sigurds. Thank you. Does the foundation uh, fund operating? If yes. Somebody, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we have again. We've recently amended the the uh, guidelines, right. and these will be available in the for our spring granting process. But we're no longer restricting um, uh, our grants just to kind of new projects. But we will operate ongoing operations that that are having a positive benefit in the community. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Director Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, th thank you for the presentation. Um, the, I'm going to follow up on the granting topic. There's the, is your grants policy publicly available? That's the one question. And the other part of that is, could you tell me what competitive means when you say a competitive process? Right. Okay. So um, our grant guidelines, eligibility, and restrictions are on the foundation's website, sccfoundation.com. We are in the process, though, that those are the current ones, and we're just figuring out this new grant um, regime that our board has approved where we can give multi-year grants, we can give larger grants, we can fund uh, operations and ongoing programs. So that information is not yet up on the website because we're still figuring out the details. And um, sorry, your second question was? Um, the details on what competitive means. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, about half of the grants we give out this year are available for community groups to apply to us. And it's competitive in the sense that we have a committee that ranks them and decides yes or no, we will or will not um, accept an application and award a grant. So it's similar to what many other organizations on the coast do. Yeah. Yeah. Director McMahon? I'm just curious. Uh, your investment portfolio, do you have a fossil fuels policy? That's a very good question. Uh, we are working on that. Um, we're currently invested with two of the major investment um, advisors in Vancouver who use an ESG approach, so environmental social governance, which is a proactive approach to 
it kind of makes sure you're working with the best in the field, but it currently doesn't exclude uh, fossil fuel companies, and we are on the spectrum moving towards having a fossil fuel free option. We're just not there yet. See no further questions. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to the vital signs report. Which, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's fine. No rush. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next item on the agenda, item number three, uh, presentation delegations, is um, Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 341.12, 2019, and Zoning Bylaw 310.185. And we have uh, two presenters, uh, Caitlin Hicks of Roberts Creek, first presenter. I invite you to come forward, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Not a highly technological person. I just wanted to say namaste to everyone. I see you. I respect you. And I thank you for being here. Um, sometimes these uh, things are contentious and stressful, but I want to say that I acknowledge that you are here for the benefit of the community. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to address two things. Um, first, I must say that we would be greatly adversely affected with the changes in these bylaws. Three additional full-size houses would be zoned in an area directly adjacent to our property, which for the past 27 years has been surrounded by five acres of forest. After surviving months and months of unrelenting construction super noise for the first building on this lot, our semi-rural neighborhood is adjusting to the noises and activities of daily life that has increased with the addition of the house brought to this property by Sarah Jacobs. But I get that. She's um, there abiding by the bylaws at the moment. As seniors, our income is limited. Both my husband and I would like to continue living in place as we age. This new subdivision could drive us out of our home, unable to continue to afford to pay the mortgage where we live now. A few years back, we have renovated one room of our home to a modest accommodation to provide some income stability in our lives. Now in this competitive B&B market, we compete simply because we are known to be in a quiet neighborhood. Newer B&B owners with renovated spaces provide modern kitchens, bathrooms, hot tubs, every appliance and comfort, square footage, things we cannot afford. The only thing that sets us apart is quiet and rural, and our business relies on it. Although neighbors live on either side of this property, we are all of our, on either side of us, we are all surrounded on the back side by the property in question, previously an untouched forest. Now the land is mostly cleared, but at least it isn't stuffed with houses and outbuildings. Subdividing this property to allow for three additional full-size houses on that land parcel, plus various outbuildings, would turn this rural neighborhood into a new subdivision, a permanent physical demonstration of urban sprawl. The staff report justification of two large houses versus four houses with the same buildable square footage stretches logic. The reality is four houses instead of two, four families instead of two, a minimum of four households of automobiles, four households of weed eaters, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, and chainsaws, four households of traffic and air pollution, four households using water and septic at the height of summer, four houses of wood splitting and fireplace smoke, a voice of shouting of dogs barking, barking, the chaos of suburban living. You argue that this particular subdivision is in keeping with the rural character of the community, but the manifestation of these changes would not only define our experience here as suburban, it would also delete the habitat of deer, raccoons, squirrels, snakes, and birds currently relying on this area as their home. OCP is a plan for all Roberts Creekers, not just an individual here and there. We've lived here for 27 years. Roberts Creek has been preserved as a rural area thanks to the official community plan. It encourages the development of properties closer to the downtown core as well as fill in for all properties as currently zoned before the change of existing bylaws. Their letter of refusal on this property is clear. 
as a result of thorough discussion of the parcel size and its location, the OCP does not support this subdivision because it does not align with the OCP. In spite of this clear no, staff recommendations argue that this suggested change to bylaws is in keeping with the official community plan to provide a range of housing alternatives and expands the housing market for low income residents. But there is no proof that anything built on this property would cater to low income people at all. Creating new housing on a piecemeal basis is exactly what causes urban sprawl. And there is no proof that housing and rental prices come down because of it. The recent adoption of Section 18 passed without proper public dialogue and without consensus opens the door by amorphous interpretation to anyone who has the money while using the now convenient words low income housing, a term which is not even defined. This application was initiated and rejected by the OCP before Section 18 was adopted. Staff map of the proposed property borders on the half acre subdivision created long before the OCP was even in force. And you argue, the staff report argues that this change in bylaw would melt this two acre parcel into an already existing neighborhood. These half acre subdivisions in Roberts Creek were stopped with the adoption of the OCP years ago. The neighborhood that this two acre parcel is part of is a semi rural neighborhood. And 2723 Tony Road is an important piece of land that links to the larger parcels and maintains the rural nature of the area. So this is where the map comes in that I, that I gave you guys with the yellow in it. So instead of looking at, at, looking at it as the area that's been dotted, look at it as the area that's been colored in yellow. That's what the property is part of, the neighborhood is part of. Um, what else am I saying? Da, 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 da. Furthermore, the proposed change of these bylaws is a precedent setting case. To alter the bylaws for this one property at this time in the history of the Sunshine Coast, especially when the OCP has rejected it, and using newly minted Section 18 as a justification creates a precedent for others who want to explore the rural nature of Roberts Creek that we have saved until now for their own personal gain. This is the Pandora's box that you, SCRD directors and staff, are deliberately opening the piecemeal destruction of Roberts Creek. I wonder what is causing this climate of panic in the government, the staff, and the leadership to change these community determined bylaws. Many residents are familiar with the concessions they have had to make to conform to this plan on their own properties. They have made these concessions to preserve the special rural nature of Roberts Creek. I have spoken to many of these homeowners. How do you think they are feeling now that anyone can change the bylaws on a piecemeal basis using this process, which is clearly pro-suburban development? Now is the time to support the OCP because this is exactly what it was created to do, to provide the needed guidance when government is under pressure to develop and densify. In this case, we can agree with the OCP's compromise. The subdivision of this property so that Sarah Jacobs and her financial partner can each legally own an acre of land, but that the density would be limited to what is currently allowed, one full size house per acre of property. This does not change the spirit of the bylaw, but it maintains OCP's limits to development. Also it would ensure that for five years at least my husband and I <laughs> could continue to live in our home as we age. Our home is, really is an example of low income senior housing. If you destroy this neighborhood with the change of bylaws and our business is reduced by the noise of yet another suburban neighborhood, we will have to sell and go where? The buyer would most assuredly be someone with more money than we have. Is that what you want? Four full size houses destroying our rural neighborhood with the hopes of lowering rents eventually all the while disrupting existing verifiable low income and senior housing already in place. We don't owe it to people who are moving into our neighborhoods to change our bylaws and destroy our rural ambience for their personal profit, especially if their changes take away our income and quality of lives. We are saying if you want to move into our neighborhood, our Roberts Creek community, abide by these bylaws that were put into place for the benefit of all Creekers.
Thank you much for your presentation. Um, any members? Uh, I have an annex here of signatures of people that okay. have signed a, a, a thing acknowledging the work of the OCP, basically agreeing with what I said. So you, you'll get this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, directors, have any questions? Director Pratt? Can we have a motion to receive uh, the highlighted yeah. um, uh, piece that uh, Caitlin has provided us as well, please? You seconded? Are you seconding the? Um, are you including the petition? Or? Um, if you if you'd like to provide the peti petition at this time, then we yes. can yep. we can make okay. that we can do them both at the same time. And then. also my presentation today, I have okay. it written, so you yep. can have a copy of it. Certainly. Okay. Yep. Let's make a motion to, motion to receive, to receive all receive those everything? items. Okay. Please. You second that, Director Hiltz. Okay. Uh, discussion. Um, Director Ties. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to. Uh, give mostly the other directors the floor on this one here uh, for any questions. I, I've got a, a fair amount of background knowledge on this on this uh, issue. Um, I just wanted uh, to add a couple of clarifications. Uh, one is... is Tyson, are you speaking to the motion? Is a motion on the floor? Oh, sorry. Sorry. The motion is to receive the, uh, oh, yes, the presentation and documentation. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Okay. That's approved. This is, okay, and just uh, reminding the rural directors that this is a, a rural director voting issue, and it is not a uh, uh, an issue for the municipalities uh, here. So, okay, so director Ty, sorry again. My apologies. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, <laughs> um, yeah. So just to clarify a couple of things, um, just to to uh, maybe help the other directors get oriented. Um, uh, we can see on the map here where the um, uh, the application is, um, and then we've got um, just south of it that triangle. There it was uh, the topping property that was just recently uh, in front of the board. Um, uh, that's now going for third reading and adoption today, uh, and then we've uh, and that uh, Caitlin's property is the second dot down on those four lots there. So I just wanted to uh, kind of give you guys a, a, a way to orient yourself as to where everything is and, and how it is. Um, so I'll, I'll open the, the floor for other directors to have to ask questions. And just just remind directors, this item is item four on your agenda, so we'll be coming up for discussion and uh, uh, further presentation from staff yet. So okay. seeing no further questions, thank you, Caitlin, for your presentation. and. Um, I'd invite Sarah Jacobs to come forward. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. So Thank and, you. Uh, you're also you're the owner of the applicant for I'm the 2723. I'm currently the applicant. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to say good morning. I'd like to uh, say thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, and thank Caitlin for her uh, providing all her information as well. Um, I'm Sarah Jacobs. I live in Roberts Creek. I've been there for 15 years and live there with my three children and partner. I'd like to provide some background and context to my application. A few years ago, we were outgrowing our small creeker home, no closets, joint bedrooms, small little place. And I had contractors out to give me a quote and it didn't make financial sense to do the renovation we needed in order to make it work for our family. And I started looking at more affordable options of what I could do. I found the listing Lot C on Tony Road. I looked it up on the SCRD property viewer and saw that it was a large lot with smaller lots nearby. The price was too much for us to afford on our own, but I had a friend interested in property if it could be subdivided. I contacted the SCRD planning department and asked if it had the potential to be subdivided. The planning technician looked at it, at, looked at it up and said that the minimum lot size for that area was 0.98 acres, and it was a 2.1 that there was enough for two lots. I asked him what the two one parcels would be allowed, and he said two homes. He said that subdivision is never like a guarantee. You have to work with Ministry of Transportation. You have to do Vancouver Coastal Health. But I was doing my due diligence and to look at the background to see if this was even a feasible option. Um, I then called and checked with Colin at the Ministry of Transportation uh, if there would be any issues as it had already an existing road frontage. 
as well as I, I checked with Darren Mulder at the Vancouver Coastal Health Unit to see if there's any red flags regarding soil in the area or septic issues and, and things as I couldn't dig any holes until you actually acquire and purchase the property and I didn't want to take that on if that wasn't a possibility. So uh, there were, didn't seem any red flags and the technician and planning had said as far as the SCRD side was concerned it was eligible to be applied for subdivision. I was happy to found an affordable opportunity that my family could afford and one that had the potential that one day my kids could build a house on for the next generation on that land because I don't think it's sustainable that we all have one house, one property, one land. Um, just something's going to shift in land ownership. I don't think it can sustain what you know, we were obviously seeing that now for affordability. Um, I was happy that there may be an opportunity for my kids to stay in the community where they are growing up in. Uh, we called and double-checked with the SCRD planning before we made an offer. Then we triple-checked before we removed subjects and was told the same thing each time, that the minimum lot size was 0.98 acres. While at the land surveyor's office, it was discovered that unfortunately an error was made by the SCR SCRD staff member and we were misinformed. We tried to get out of the real estate sale and the seller would not give the deposit back. I came and met with Andrew Ellen to discuss the situation and decided applying for a rezoning of the parcel was the best thing to do in the situation and began that process. Looking at the size of the lots in the surrounding neighborhood and the residential areas to the east and west of 2723 Tony Road, um, I believe to one point, like a 1.04 and a 1.05 acre lot would be comparable to what's in the area. And I don't know if, I don't have a, um, I, I believe you guys have access to the, the same map. Uh, and, you know, I know that the Cheryl Ann Park subdivision, which created a lot of homes in Roberts Creek, was a very contentious issue as well. And I know um, that this area is in between a very a denser area, which I lived in off near Lower and Joe and um, further in. But I, I find that the walkability to the creek, its location, and again, ironically, the half acre parcel that Caitlin lives on in that area that had been subdivided, um, I think that it, it fits, it doesn't really make a huge difference in the parcel size in the neighborhood. Um, we had test holes done and inspected and found favorable results, which are detailed in the Vancouver Coastal Health Letter from Chris Morse, as well as further investigated by Bert Telder of Telder Engineering, which Yuli has received copies of. I believe this parcel's location with walking distance to the heart of the creek and school should be considered for rezoning to allow the two parcels. The majority of the clearing in this lot was already done in 2010, and I plan to maintain the surrounding forests and trees. Um, the co affordability is obviously a major issue on the coast, and we're, we're in the, that crisis. Construction costs on the coast are very high compared to Vancouver Island and the mainland, and are another barrier for affordability, even on raw land. Uh, or sorry, especially on raw land, even with barging in a home like we had done, uh, we saved that home from a landfill, barged over a good quality home, and then still having the, the cost of working with that home is still, is, is still very expensive. Um, my intention for what would be my side of the proposed subdivided parcel would be to keep the back half of the acre intact as forest and maintain it as that for decades until maybe one day one of my children build there down the road. And I've explained that to Caitlin and she's brought up the good point that even though I have that intention, what could stop, say something happens to me and someone else takes on that lot and what if they want to knock down that forest and build a house? So I definitely see... I know where I am at on it, but I understand that the other side of the coin of where Caitlin's looking ahead in terms of future possibilities on there. Um, I think having keeping it as the forest would make the neighbors happy as well as respect the natural environment. Uh, the front part that is already cleared, I'd like to build a smaller home and create a rental while we are stay in the house that's been constructed and we're renting from uh, my friend. And we need the larger home now with the kids, but later on I could then move into a, a, the smaller home that would be, um, would be done. I went to door to door to the neighborhood and when I delivered the notices for previous, the previous public information meeting, 
I was grateful to have the support of surrounding neighbors, with the exception, obviously, Caitlin, uh, for reasons she shared. And um, the, I'm a bit concerned with the petition. I'd like to ask Caitlin if it's okay. Um, was that the initial p um, signatures when you sent out the petition with not the correct information, like the one that I had received via email from someone saying that I was going to build three homes on the lot? For the two, for the, the potential for three homes on the lot. Okay. Um, and what else did I want to say? The proposed, uh, as uh, mentioned, it borders the toppings, one and a half acre property just below, which is undergoing a similar uh, application. And I'm looking for that, the rezone for the D, not the C, um, for the half acre lots, for just a one, the one acre. Um, and that's I pretty much what I guess I have to say right now is that I feel like if I, uh, look at it moving forward proactively on the unfortunate incident that happened on with information came, coming from the SCRD. I think that if I look at it from road access, from the soil, from location to surrounding parcels to the intention of not developing it and not putting on four full-size homes, I've spoken to my friend um, who would be my co-owner um, in the situation um, and went before acquiring it to split into two and he is uh, he is not planning on building a second full-size home uh, either he's just wanting to uh, have the one that we're living in right now and yeah okay. thank you Sarah Jacobs mm -hmm. uh, again um, directors any questions director Hiltz uh, yes chair um, yeah, um, do you want to set up your microphone thanks I, I'm interested in the error that you mentioned. What what was that error? In the for the petition? Uh, no, you said oh. there was an SCRD staff error, and it, can, and it yes. conflicted with your uh, intention to uh, back out of the deal. Yes. So when we phoned, I phoned planning, and I sp spoke to Sven Kovalitz. Sven is the one. And I dealt with him at the counter. I dealt with him on the phone. He is the one who informed me that as far as the SCRD requirements that this had enough land to apply for subdivision. So that based, and I told him, and I shared directly with him that we were only being able to undertake this if my friend and I, based on to, to, to be able to afford it, I couldn't afford to do and buy a $500,000 lot and then build a home on it for my family. And he, um, I said, I knew that there was the SCRD requirement to, or to be eligible to, to subdivide based on your criteria, then the Ministry of Transportation and then the health units. Those are sort of the three main bodies. And he was saying as far as the SCRD one was concerned that it would be eligible to be applied for subdivision. And that's why we, and then I called before we made the offer and said, okay, I'm sorry, I just want to double check that because, and he said, yes, minimum lot size 0 0.98 acres you know, you've got 2.1, there's enough for two lots. That's what he said. Then we triple checked before we removed the subjects. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like a crazy person calling, but it, I didn't have that money to poof, disappear and had to borrow it even and to, to, do, to do the purchase. And we, again, before we removed the final subjects, had to triple checked and Sven told us again, yes, two lots, 0.98 that that was it. So that was sort of what I feel like I'm not some willy-nilly developer who's coming in and I'm, I did my due diligence. I looked at my background. I don't think this sets a precedence because I don't, I think it's each case is unique. And I think if I, as a general public person had called and spoken to him and said, is this eligible to be uh, subdivided and was told no, then I wouldn't have proceeded with this. Like that it, so I'm, I don't think it sets a precedence because I don't think everybody's going to go around buying property and then trying to, um, trying to, to subdivide it. So that was unfortunate. And, and I spoke to Andrew Allen at length. We had meetings and about like, hey, how do we, and he felt terrible for what happened and how to move, move forward on this. And I had tried to get out of the real estate sale the seller wouldn't give us a backer deposit. I, you know, 
looked at what options and and I came to talk to Andrew to say, well, can the SCRD provide the down payment so that I'm not having to go on a line of credit to, for this? And he says, no, you can't. You'd have to sue the SCRD, at which point I broke into tears because <laughs> I don't have the time and the money or the stress levels. It's, it's already been a two-year process. Director Lee? It was uh, just something I was curious about. Um, there was a suggestion that um, the, uh, the bed and breakfast area is um, surrounded by forests and is in a rural area. I can't quite see that from the map. I'm not sure what I'm missing. Um, what I see is that the back of the property borders on yours, and I'm guessing you have some trees, but what what gives the what gives the feeling of a treed rural area to the bed and breakfast uh, operation? I don't the the trees. There's been six trees that were taken down for the putting up of the home to do for safety of tree roots and where it was. I don't plan on thank you. I don't plan on um, taking anything down along that corridor. And like I say, if you I can provide photos from 2010 of when the initial clearing of the forest was done and it was essentially blackberries that were this high. It was a, a giant blackberry patch and then but the the there is a more intact half acre part of the forest in the back which I was looking at maintaining. And it's hard. I understand Airbnb, but I'm also looking at I I'm I were a family of five. We've you know, our dogs passed away. We'd like to get another one, but we you know, we have kids, they're riding bikes. It's the sound of family, it's the sound of life. It might not be. I, I want to respect the B&Bs and what they're doing, and um, I'm not looking at making um, taking away from that. I like to work with that, and I've approached Caitlin on that as well, offering to try and pay to plant things to help create more more privacy. Um, I had a landscaper come out to meet with me to see where we could plant things and he suggested things closer on her edge of the property to grow up but I also provided photos for Yuli of the view from our place over and um, there's I think it's 160 feet between our house and her the property line the current one it's quite a distance and um, yeah thank you I, <laughs> I bet you Andreas could probably give me a better feel for what makes the rural area there. Or Caitlin? Chair, would you oppose if Caitlin responded? No, no. Caitlin? Um, yeah, I'm the one that described the rural area of, of our property and how it backs onto hers. Um, it's just... Uh, it's just, if, if you saw the pictures of the property that we have, we've nurtured it to be as natural as possible in the setting because we are surrounded on both sides by half-acre people. The, the, the neighbor on one side is just not seen at all. The neighbor on the other side is, is we're, you know, we're both working to keep that screen of natural stuff. But um, on the back, when she, she moved her house there, um, where there was nothing but forest, there is now this big house that we can see, and there's all this logs on the property line. And you, it just, um, it, but it's, it's still okay uh, because we do have some kind of a, a buffer. But um, my, my thing about it being rural is, is mainly about, I mean, it's about the visual, yes, absolutely, and it's also about the noise. Because when my guests come, they always talk about how quiet it is uh, there. And sometimes, I, sometimes they ask if, you know, how quiet it is. Do we hear sounds from the road at all? And then they won't come if they hear sounds from the road or whatever. But um, it, it's not that I'm a B&B &B to be lumped up with all the other B&Bs as a B&B. &B. We have one room that's an accommodation that's very humble as an accommodation, but it does provide income that helps us pay our mortgage. And the only thing that sets us apart 
is the fact that it's quiet. We've had to reduce our rates because of the competition in the B&B market. Um, but that's fine. It's, it's kind of a steady thing. And um, it's because it's our, our, our space is, is quiet and, and rural. Director Lee, is that answer? Thank you. Does the board have any further questions for Sarah? Okay. Hearing none, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we will move uh, immediately now on to the consideration of the um, application on second reading. And uh, uh, that's in our package uh, is uh, Annex A. And uh, I invite uh, Mr. Sayo to come to speak to this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Bimish. Um, following the first reading of the bylaws, a public information meeting was hosted by the applicant and feedback was received from the, res the referral process. Um, the proposed bylaws received support from the Advisory Planning Commission and the majority of participants in the public consultation process. Agencies and SCRD departments have no concern over the proposed development. Analysis of this report indicates that the proposed subdivision and lot size are compatible with the density and rural character of the surrounding area. The development can meet criteria of moderate density increase as set out in the policies of the official community plan and help to create a more affordable housing options. The lands also have sewage treatment capacities to support full development potential of two dwellings on each of the new lots. Staff recommend that the bylaws proceed a second reading and a public uh, hearing be held uh, to gather further community input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sayo. Um, first of all, we'll move uh, receipt of the report. Director Ties, Director McMahon, all in favor? Thank you. Um, Director Ties, I'll turn to you first as the director. Okay, um, I've got a, this has been a, a, a bit of a, um, a issue and we've, I've met with Caitlin as well as Sarah and, and we've, we've chatted about this at length and, um, uh, and as a result of also the topping app application, I've, I've gotten quite in, in, into depth on, on this whole issue and um, I've prepared a, a little thing here, um, so I'm gonna, just going to read it out. Uh, Roberts Creek is and wants to continue to be a, a rural community that generally has larger lots, more trees, and more privacy than the surrounding towns. Uh, it is not our community's goal to become a town. Uh, therefore, further densification in Roberts Creek needs to be approached carefully. Uh, this property is outside the area that encourages densi densification as per our OCP. Uh, that being said, in 2018, the community and the board adopted an OCP amendment, section 18, that encourages some densification in areas of Roberts Creek that already have some clusters of density in order to bring more affordable housing online. Um, I personally, and I know a, num a number of members of the OCP committee, uh, are not big fans of the vague uh, wording in section 18 of our OCP and we will be having a discussion around this section at our next OCPC meeting. Um, uh, currently this application conforms with the criteria set out in section 18.3 of our OCP. However, I do have some concerns. Um, we've just recently approved the topping property under the same criteria, and I would like to point out one significant difference, in my opinion, between these two properties. Uh, Section 18 is intended to bring more affordable housing online, and due to the new property sizes on the topping property, the added density um, that the rezoning allows uh, will be in the form of uh, auxiliary dwelling units, which are smaller in size than a full-size dwelling and I think this would qualify for the potential to add affordable housing, in quotation marks. What is affordable housing, right? Um, the Jacobs application differs in the sense that the two resulting parcels will be large enough to permit two full-size dwellings, which in my opinion does very little to add affordability in the commonly accepted idea of affordable housing. 
and it merely creates more density and increases the, proper, the property values. I personally would like to see Section 18 of our OCP change to bring, truly really bring smaller, more affordable housing types into the creek, like auxiliary dwelling units, um, and not as a tool for wealth creation and densification outside our core as it is currently worded. Um, at this point, I would like to move the recommendations as stated on page one with an additional recommendation that the report be forwarded to our OCP committee for comment uh, as they will, uh, will be having a discussion on section 18 at the next meeting. I volunteer to be the alternate chair for the public hearing as is the custom. Thank you, Director Titus. Other directors? Director Lee. One question um, that I have, it, it would appear to me that um, if these two lots were made, um, there would be no way of further subdividing them because there is no access to the back side. So the uh, property it appears to me would be, if they did build a second house, it would be remaining on, on the same property. So most likely, if someone does build a second residence, it is going to be an auxiliary type carriage house, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it doesn't appear that if this was approved, it is leaning to the next thing I would probably do if I was buying one of the lots is divide it in half and help pay for my half. <laughs> it doesn't look like that's a possibility here. So I just wanted to check if that was true. Director Seegers. Thank you. On page two. The Roberts Creek OCP committee has uh, proposed that the subdivision be permitted with a caveat that only one residential dwelling be permitted per lot. Given the applicant has indicated they're not looking to build for a number of years, this would be a staff question. Um, can a caveat be put on that only one residential dwelling be permitted per lot for a period of time, perhaps 10 years? That would potentially meet the needs of the you know the other, the other person here, and um, the applicant. Who would like to respond to that? Hmm. Yeah. Dr. Sale. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bingish. Um So there is a possibility to um, put a covenant on the property to specify the the number of dwellings and for a certain period of time. Yes. Thank you. Director Lee. I just wanted to make uh, one comment, and that is that what we are talking about here is um, does this go to a public information meeting, which is where the general public would get an opportunity to have a say. I think that's the kind of thing that would come up at that public hearing meeting, what, what the public would like to see. My other question was, did I hear Director Ties make a motion to accept the recommendations? Um, I, I, did I hear a motion or did I hear that you would be prepared to make a motion? No, I didn't <laughs> okay. make a motion, but it okay. hasn't been seconded. No, it hasn't been seconded yet. So, uh, Director Lee? I'd like to second the you motion. Second. Now, there was, a, there was an additional um, resolution that Director Ties wished to add. Did you, did you, uh, yes. did you capture that? Yeah. Okay. Could you... Read back the additional re resolution, please. And that the staff report be forwarded to the Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Committee for discussion. Okay. okay. And that uh, Director Ties has offered to be the um, um, on the um, it's the alternate chair. Uh, do we have somebody who wishes to be the chair of the uh, public hearing? Director McMahon is volunteering. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the uh, resolution number five then would be that uh, the director, uh, Director McMahon, uh, as chair, and Director Ties as the alternate chair of the public hearing. Okay. Does everybody understand that. Once again, Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, this would be a question again to staff. If something like the proposed caveat comes forward at the public hearing if it's not put in at place now, is that sufficient, is that a sufficient change that would require an additional public hearing? Uh, 
Mr. Hill. Uh, thank Mr. you, Chair. Hall. <laughs> thank you, Chair Beamish. Sure. Um, staff are just discussing this. There, there is an element of speculation, not knowing what the subject of a covenant might be. But uh, should should a covenant affect density, uh, then yes, that might be a case for uh, uh, an additional public hearing. Thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. So I don't have a say on this, but <laughs> um, I'm wondering if the board is amenable and those voting on this, if that could be something that would be put in now so that that is what is actually presented at the public hearing. Director, Director Ties. I'll go to Director Ties first. Um, I, I'd like to um, ask uh, the applicant if, if she'd be amenable to that. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Sarah Jacob. Um, I'm open to working together to find a way that fits with the community with my neighbor as well as I'm just trying in my head to process okay what because we haven't we can't do anything with that side until we know if it's going to be our side and if it is that whole process I would I feel a little bit like oh my gosh how can I make a decision within a month of what because looking at the cost of building at th over $300 a square foot for a home I'm also wouldn't mind the option of if I had a smaller home um, that would be something more that I could afford and then maybe an auxiliary or something like that where it would be two smaller size homes that so that but I just don't I'm a little bit like okay f I don't know how Caitlin's you know years this caveat is in place before just wanting to see how that would impact me and my family so I'd be my, my preference would be is this uh, the length of this process has been going if there was a way to um, not decide right now in this moment what the caveat would be, but maybe myself and Caitlin, Andreas, or I don't know how we would do that to, to meet to, and then have that be presented at the public hearing. Would you be okay with that? So we're talking about the termination. Is that what we're talking about? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is I, I think it's sort of up in the air trying to be defined right now, and I'm just saying that I think it'd be, I'd like, I'd appreciate the time to sort of process what the caveat yeah. And if I could respond as well, I think it's probably a little bit unfair to ask the applicant on the fly, especially when you have a partner mm -hmm. as well who is not present here. But it could come forward at the public hearing. Mm -hmm. It could come forward as an, and this can be amended uh, at third reading. Okay. And so that um, it could come forward again. So what they're asking for, suggesting is that the on the two two new lots, which they are two new lots, that a covenant be placed on those lots to restrict the, the development of those lots to one single family house only. And, uh, sorry? For a period of time. So, so that, uh, so that it could be for a 10 year period or whatever sort of thing. So that uh, could be looked at. So, and, but you'd have to speak here on behalf of your partner as well because mm -hmm. it could affect you both or it could just affect yeah. one lot or, uh, but something could come forward later on as a consideration. Okay. So you'd have that option to bring that forward. Okay. It could come forward as being a covenant being placed on title, and it could be part of the resolution uh, that is approved ultimately by the board that that's the limitation or restriction on this lot sort of thing, or these two lots. No, it could it could come up at the public hearing. It could be a solution at the public hearing and say, well, look, uh, if, if Sarah Jacob and her partner were prepared to make that agreement, then it could come forward at the public hearing as, 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 a, as an additional uh, resolution to be approved. Yeah. Yeah. It was something they could work on as, as an option. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, did you, what was the speaker? Director yeah, I, I just, I'm a little confused where we are in terms of process here, yeah. but I, I did want to say that I don't want to start monkeying with this and adding covenants and things when we have not. None of us, I think, understands all the ramifications, so I don't think it's appropriate at this time. Okay, the, we have the resolution on the table, and that is uh, instead of the uh, uh, 
two, three, four, and five. We have the additional six. Does everybody understand the, re the resolutions? Director Hiltz? I'm going to come back to the process question with regards to what GM Hall mentioned about having, if this varies density, that would require speculative, a second public hearing. Is, so I'm just, is this, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the steps here. Director Hall? Or, yeah, I guess you're a director. So. <laughs> Mr. Hall. Everybody's a director today, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, so procedurally, um, the, the report that's in front of the committee recommends um, recommends uh, a bylaw to be advanced for second reading and for a public hearing. And uh, pu the public hearing would be held on the basis of that bylaw. And from the public hearing, staff would prepare further analysis on uh, the submissions received at that hearing and come back with uh, recommendations for third reading. And uh, should those recommendations uh, fundamentally change the use or density of the of the land from what was proposed at the time of the public hearing, then a requirement for a second public hearing would ensue and staff would provide procedural guidance uh, at that time. Thank you. Okay, so I understand then we have two options right now before us. One would be to not proceed with second reading today, but to give the applicant an opportunity to consider uh, the covenant option and then amend the applic current application and which would then go forward as a, an amended application to third reading uh, to, to, to the public hearing. Is, is that correct? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. So the option to defer the uh, defer the report to allow time for discussion of a voluntary covenant is is an option that's available. Yes, thank you. Back to you, applicant, Sarah Jacob. Do you wish to take some time to consider the option of a covenant at this time before it goes to, before we refer to the public hearing? Or do you wish the opportunity to do it at a later date, which may require a second public hearing? Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair Bumish. I, um, I think as with the length of the process, if it would be expedited or, or able to be combined where we could meet and have a discussion before and then dovetail it into the public hearing November, I would like to do that because otherwise don't we have to go back to square one and I have to do a public inform? Yeah, I'm open to whatever will help the process. Director Tyus. Yeah, just to clarify, I think that it would be more expedient if we deferred this uh, to right now and, and then not have to schedule two public, public hearings. So that okay. would be the fastest route. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. And defer this to the next meeting of the Planning and Development Committee? Yeah, which would be in November. October. October. Right. And then would I still have the, the public hearing in November? November 4th? No. Well, it, it could be. It could make a November public hearing, I'm assuming. If we meet in October, do you hold the date? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Staff here, the interest and expediency. Uh, the date can be held uh, for the time being, and staff can uh, look at opportunities to ensure that the process moves forward as efficiently as possible while maintaining the requirement for public notice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So a motion to defer? Moved by Director Tai, seconded by Director McMahon. Further discussion? All in favor? And this defer to the uh, next uh, Planning Development Committee meeting in October. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you for coming up with a creative solution potentially that could be discussed and, uh, and look at that. So uh, I have a question for staff. Um, and it's, it's not... Uh, specified to any particular individual, but Director Hall or the CAO, perhaps you could respond to this. And What was missed when Sarah Jacobs contacted the SCRD three times 
and asked about the, the lot and the potential that was then subsequently captured at land titles? And how can we avoid that type of situation in the future? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Beamish. So uh, staff acknowledge and regret that incons inconsistent information about the subdivision district zoning uh, was provided and uh, have worked uh, diligently uh, to support the applicant's consideration of options uh, since that inconsistency was realized. Since that, since this uh, instance occurred, staff have put in place a, a double check system. Thank you. Thank you. So that, um, okay, so you, ha you are aware of the process and you have major changes internally. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Director Lee. I'd just like a little clarification on the densification issue. We were suggesting that we were proposing a more increased densification. And if it was turned down and we had a smaller densification, it's still, the, the, the answer would still be the same, right? Any change in a public hearing in densification, whether it's more or less, has to be returned to the public hearing. Is that correct? Staff? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. We're not entertaining questions from the, from the audience. Thank you. But you can have access to staff about 1230, I think, <laughs> the way we're going. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to thank both of uh, the participants to, for your, your patience with us and for your submissions. And uh, I look forward to seeing this in October and, and uh, hearing how you've made out uh, between you. Thank you very much. So, okay. okay, we're moving on now to item five, which is the uh, report by the corporate, corporate officer uh, for the um, uh, speakers for 2019 resolutions to UBCM. Um, convention. The corporate officer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report is coming forward in anticipation of the 2019 Union, Union of BC Municipalities Convention being held later this month. Ten SCRD sponsored resolutions have been con submitted for consideration at the conference. The purpose of this report is to identify lead speakers to introduce each resolution should they be pulled for debate on the convention floor. The report also summarizes how the resolutions have been classified by UBCM and how they will be handled on the convention floor. It should be noted that the resolutions on BC Ferries Foot Passenger Service and Coast Forest Revitalization will be considered individually rather than part of a block, and as such, the SCRD will be invited to introduce each as they come forward for consideration. Okay. Thank you very much. Motion to receive the report. Moved. Seconded. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Um, speakers, uh, do we have any suggestions? Director Pratt, did you want to speak to this first? Well, of course, I'm happy to speak to anybody, any one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I have no fear of yeah. that. Um, uh, specifically, the foot passenger service, but um, it, being as we know that it will be, uh, it, that it is standalone, um, and I'm, I'm happy to open up the, um, the coast forest as well. Um, being as those are the two that we know, unless uh, any of the directors mm -hmm. wants to jump in on e any one of those. Yeah, and, and what we're talking about here is somebody has to actually be present to move, move the resolution to, uh, uh, at the, uh, the mics. And the resolutions that will be considered yeah. individually, yes. you do not need to be present to move them, but yeah. there will be an invitation to speak to, speak them. to them. Yes, that's correct, yeah. And, uh, and anybody can speak to them at that point in time. So. Um, for the discussion, Director Ties. Yeah, so uh, as I understand it, uh, resolution uh, ones and twos are not admitted for debate, so we don't really actually need to put a speaker to them. Um, uh, number, the only one that really stands out as the ones, or the, no, there's, a, there's a few of them that have. Um, including number six and eight uh, that 
I have no recommendation and will be actually part of the debate. Um, so this is where we really want some speakers. Um, all the other ones are um, as m being moved as part of a block. Uh, I personally volunteer to be uh, the, the man on deck on, for number five and number ten. And uh, I'm wondering, and I'm also willing to speak to number eight if, if, if need be, uh, or be the speaker. So, um, but uh, maybe somebody else might, would want to volunteer for that one as well. So, yeah, the, if you look through the details, you can see that uh, number one and two are actually uh, not submitted, uh, admitted for debate, so we don't even need to bother uh, talking to them. Uh, number three is one that's being moved as a block. Number four is being moved as a block. Number five is um, also as a block. Number six is not move, being moved as a block, so we definitely need a speaker for that one. Seven is also moved as a block. Eight is um, also not moved as a block, so that's where we need another speaker. Nine is where we um, is moved, being moved as a block again, and number 10 is also being moved as a block. So it's only number six and eight where we really need to uh, have, a, have a speaker. Um, on the floor and available um, with potential that somebody might call out number five and uh, or any of the other ones being moved as a block. So as I said, I'm volunteering to be the man on deck for number five and 10, and I'm willing to speak to number eight or be the lead on number eight. One of the things that uh, I think is recognized is that even though they're going as a block, I believe that they can be on the floor uh, pulled from the block uh, to be individually voted on. You see a corporate officer? Thank you, Chair. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So that if we had any that you wanted to uh, particularly have a discussion of or vote on, uh, that's one thing as well that the board could do is request they be pulled by the block, and then, then you'd have to have a speaker available for them. Director Hiltz? Uh, um, so as far as what I see, we're just trying to kind of schedule who's going to be available at that time so they're not booking themselves. They, they need to be available. That's kind of mostly what we're doing for, for the ones not yeah. uh, not being debated. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. kind of trying to anticipate as, yeah. as the process goes along what might be coming up as, as, as opposed to standing outside the minister's room going for a meeting yeah. or a staff meeting. Uh, something, so. um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. put my name forward for number nine as, a, as the backup plan. Yeah. Yeah. Director Seegers? Number three. Number three, you'd like that pulled? No, no you're going to put me down no, for no, speaking okay, on that. Okay, okay. Uh, I believe that uh, Councillor Ladwig uh, will speak to number six as well. Um, yeah, that's an uh, interest of hers. So, okay. Director Seegers? Sorry, <laughs> Director Pratt? <laughs> we don't spend that much time Chair together. Pratt. <laughs> <Chair> Pratt. <laughs> um, as I said, yes, I'm happy to speak yeah. with number six. Um, okay. If number seven gets pulled, I'll speak to that one as okay. well. Um, because sometimes, and I know this from my previous yeah. iteration as a school board trustee, the rest of the province does not necessarily yes. understand Ferris. what it means to be a BC Ferries yeah. community. Yeah. So Correct. they can sometimes get pulled and voted against. Correct. So. Okay, so we have a uh, Director McMahon. I'm always interested in alternative transportation infrastructure, so I could be around for number five if okay. we need right, somebody. So. Do we have enough people at this point? It appears to be that uh, we do. And uh, and the other thing is that you've all got your, your books. Sorry, um, Corporate Officer. Thank you, Chair. I don't have a speaker for number four. Parking Enforcement, oh, that will be uh, Director Lee. Yes, yeah. we'll nominate yeah. him. But we know who brought it up. <laughs> yeah. okay. Director Hiltz. Um, just process question. This is kind of guidelines, right? You yeah. know, like if, if, if Leonard for some reason cannot make oh, it. Exactly. You know, we, we, we yeah, can do exactly. on the fly stuff. Exactly. So this is just yeah. kind of getting at the first yeah. draft. Yeah. 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 Director Seegers. Thank you. Given that one and two are not actually being admitted for debate, do we need to put somebody up for them? Corporate officer. Thank you, Chair. 
So those two resolutions will be grouped with numerous others, and they will be considered individually, so there will be debate on the convention floor, and it would be up to the directors if they choose to participate or not. They can assign, you can assign speakers or just be aware when they come up on the floor, because they will be individually debated. Director Segers? Thank you. If I read this, it says that this is being blocked together with B-139, so this would not necessarily be separate, but we would want to speak to it underneath B-139, is what you're saying. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. How many have actually been to UBCM before? Okay, good. So it's an interesting process, and the actual voting, we've all got our packages now so that you see all the resolutions that are there and how they're blocked together, and when we actually get the agenda, and I don't believe we've seen the agenda yet, have we, for the day? Okay, and that you'll see there are specific periods where resolutions are considered, and then there's other periods where you're wandering the trade fair or standing outside ministers' doors or staff doors for meetings. So it's a busy time, and so it's a matter of kind of keeping a look at those blocks of time for when the resolutions are being considered. Director Segers? Thank you. I'll take number two, and then that would be it. When SR-1 comes up, if there are points in there to be made, then that would be where I'd speak next. I'll do one. Director Tice will do one. Okay. I think we're all covered. Good. Okay, thank you. Do we have a resolution? Okay, that the received speaker list for each resolution be established and recommendations be brought forward to the board meeting September 12, 2019. So moved by Director Segers, Director Pratt. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving to Annex C on the agenda, Item 6, Senior Plan. This is Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 641.10-2018 and Zoning Amendment Bylaw 310.179-2018 for 2720 Lower Road, consideration of third reading and adoption. Director Tice. Do we want to have the staff speak to this first? Oh, sorry, yes. Staff, please. Go ahead. I apologize. Thank you, Chair. So this report summarizes the feedbacks from the public hearing. The majority of participants of the public hearing support the proposed bylaws and subdivision. The development is consistent with densification strategies of the official community plan and can help to create more affordable housing options. The impact of additional dwellings on the road system and transportation is negligible and of no concern to the Ministry of Transportation. The subject lands can also support sewage treatment capacity for additional dwellings. So based on the overall planning analysis and public feedback on this development proposal, staff recommend that the bylaw proceed to a third reading. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive the report. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Director Tice. So as I've, yeah, as I've discussed before in the other application, the topping property is just south of the Jacobs property there. And I feel like that section 18, which I'm not a big fan of as it's worded right now, is, makes this application possible. That being said, the fact that it's an auxiliary dwelling that's being proposed as the added density makes me feel comfortable to approve this one because I think that auxiliary dwelling units are essentially something that could be considered affordable housing. Thank you, Director Tice. Are there any further comments, Director's comments? We have two resolutions, so we're prepared to move the resolutions. Director Tice. And the condition being placed on that is that the further consideration of the Robert Creek Official Plan Bylaw 
and the following condition be met. This is a resolution three, approval by the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure pursuant to section 52 of the act. So, um, understand the resolutions, all in favor? Mo sorry? Seconder. Seconder, sorry. Uh, seconder, second, Director McMahon, sorry. All in favor? Yep. Opposed, nothing. Thank you very much, that's a passed as well, thank you. Uh, Annex D, um, item seven. Uh, senior Planner Development Variance Permit Application uh, DVP 0043, um, yeah, in electoral, uh, electoral Area F. So go back to Mr. Sale. Thank you, Jeffrey Mish. Um, so this is a Development Variance Permit Application seeking zero setback from the parcel lines abutting Marine Drive in West House Sound. And side parcel lines as well in order to install retaining walls along the parcel lines. So the subject parcels are small contiguous parcels with shallow depths and steep grade along the frontage of Marine Drive. The retaining walls will be used to stabilize the steep slope and provide for sufficient building area on these parcels. The existing hatch uh, along the road um, provides screening uh, of the uh, retaining walls and help to blend them with the surrounding uh, environment. The variance meets all criteria in order to be considered for approval, including consistency with the intent of the zoning bylaw and official community plan. No adverse impact on adjacent properties or natural environment and a reasonable solution for the given circumstances. Staff recommend issuing the variance permit subject to the applicant obtaining a, a setback permit from the Ministry of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive the report. Director Hiltz. Director McMahon, all in favor? Thank you. Um, Director Hiltz, I'll turn to you first. Uh, thanks, Chair Beamish. Uh, a couple questions. First one's on, on process. Um, uh, this is a development variance permit, and um, SERD website says a, a DVP is for a single parcel. And I see that this is for four parcels, so I'm, I'm interested, is this, is, does the applicant own all the parcels or is he acting as agent for some of the parcels? I, I'm, I'm not quite clear on that. Planner? Thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, the owners have um, asked a, the applicant as their representative and they all signed the application form to use their, the, the agent as their, their representative for this application. So the variance will be for uh, all those lots. Thank you. Each lot would have a variance on it ultimately. Is that correct? Uh, will be lot 13 through 16. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hills? Uh, just to follow up, so um, like the DVPs, it says one $500 for one dwelling in a single parcel. So is, it, is, there, is this a $2,000 application? Planner? No, the, the fee is for one application, which deals with variance for um, those multiple parcels. Thank you. Just, uh, just a comment. Uh, the, the website shows $500 for a single parcel, so I, I was just confused about that. So um, I'm interested in the clarification is, does the fee apply to a single parcel, or can you bundle parcels under one application? Staff? Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, that's, that was the case for this particular application because uh, all the parcels are adjacent to each other. Um, certainly, there, there's an opportunity we can clarify that on the, the fees um, schedule or on the website. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, and that is the, uh, and I'm a little, little, when I look at the, the plan on page 46, these lots are obviously very small, um, and um, they're not serviced by sewer, so they, are they able to support, um, each lot able to support a septic field as well? Thank you, Chair. Um, According to the applicant, um, the, the, the whole reason for this retaining wall is to be able to create a, a more substantial lot size given the situation that the, lot, the lots are already small. 
So the yes, the uh, the lot will be able to support the subject system um, with the retaining wall in place, which help to um, uh, increase the lot size. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I take it to be four separate septic, septic systems, or is that, is that the intent, uh, or one? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so, is um, there is no proposal for a a, a shared subject system? So it, it will be uh, individual systems on each yeah. lot. Thank you. Thank you. Treasury Hills. Um, yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, with regards to the screening, uh, it was brought up at the APC that the the screening, the size of the wall from road grade would be almost uh, four plus three, seven meters. And I understand that the screening that is there right now is on Moti Road Allowance, on the highway right-of-way, so that the integrity of the screening is at the discretion of uh, MO2I. So do they, are they um, saying that they will leave the screening in place for the duration of this project, which would, you know, the, the parcel of the land? Staff? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we have received feedback from uh, from MOTI, um, but they did not specifically uh, mention the uh, what will happen to the hedge. Um, so all they require is a setback permit. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director. Hiltz, did you wish to move the recommendation? Uh, I, I still have some questions. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the question for me is, is coming around to the sustainability. It's uh, uh, sustainability is that idea that uh, uh, satisfy the individual needs at the moment while preserving the rights for the future to meet their needs. And the one that came up at the APC and is in the West House Sound Community plan is the uh, bike and walking path, which is along Marine Drive. And it is still, I believe, even for the town of Gibsons and the SCRD, an aspirational goal to have a uh, a connection along Marine Drive from the Langdale Ferry Terminal to Lower Gibsons. Um, I'm not sure if you can confirm that that's still uh, an aspirational goal for the town of Gibsons. It is. Okay. And I understand. Uh, um, so the concern is is that with the zero setback, it may preclude the ability for MOTI to do any kinds of improvements within the, the, right of, the highway right-of-way corridor in the future. So that, that is the concern that I have is that uh, I understand that the applicant wants to uh, uh, maximize the development potential. I'm, I'm thinking from the community point of view of Marine Drive it has a notorious area of encroachments and difficulty and it is a very challenging place to build uh, bike and path ways. So that's my concern is um, with a zero setback and the slope of the land, that future changes to MOTI right away for a bike path may in, ten, in turn compromise the, uh, the retaining wall. And so I'm wondering if staff have considered the implications of this application with respect to the future p potential of a walking and bike path and a connector to Lower Gibsons. Staff? Uh, thank you for your patience, Chair and the committee. Um, the question of future compatibility with a bike path hasn't been discussed in detail with the Ministry of Transportation. Staff are just discussing that it's, it may even be possible that a retaining wall there is a benefit to future development of a right-of-way. But as part of um, the setback permit process with the Ministry, staff can discuss that, um, that concern. Thank you. I'm, 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 uh, thanks, Chair Beamer. So I'm, what, what I'm kind of seeing is that, that as an additional condition that the, uh, 
the setback would not compromise that future future capability of the community to have a, a, a bike and walking path is that a proposal you'd like to add to um, as a uh, you had some motion the recommendations are not on the floor yet so I guess we would need to put the motion on the floor with a subsequent uh, condition as an amendment to that is that how we would have to do it you could propose a uh, at this point in time say they're not on the floor so these are ideas for discussion so you could suggest a oh, an add to the recommendation add to the recommendations yeah. um, that would be my request is to add uh, that some discussions w between the staff and the planning department uh, such that the, the bike path would not be compromised by the placement of the retaining wall Staff understand that uh, additional recommendation, so that would be then the um, obtain a setback permit from the Ministry of Infrastructure, and that the um, the subject um, will not compromise future opportunity for um, bike path active transportation. I guess we call it exactly. Now. This uh, it's, it, for me, it's kind of following yeah. in with this whole right. ability to have uh, yeah. SERD infrastructure within yeah. the right of way, yeah. and, and that's what I'm concerned right. about in yeah. the future. Yeah. Now, would you like to move that to the, oh, sorry, Director Lee. Yeah. Um, I have a question because when I was reading this, I took, uh, I took from it that the retaining wall needed to be set back from the Modi right away a certain amount. And this application was to allow uh, that it's not set back that's from the right away. That's correct. That's correct. Um, so I can't see how it could affect a bicycle path where the entire Modi right-of-way is open. You could pave right to the wall, in other words. Right to the wall. So that, and, uh, and that's what I believe Director Hills is saying, just clarification that will not impact future opportunity. If you look at the photo on page 46, I think you see the property line somewhat lined up with the hedge, the existing hedge, or the existing hedge would become the bike path and all that, that area sort of thing, potentially at some day in the future uh, if, if the uh, regional district and uh, uh, chooses to go that direction. So, so. Director Hills? Uh, thanks, Chair Breen. Just for um, Director Lee's clear, um, the, the lay of the land, this is an inside corner. So the grade from the road to where the blocks would be is a three meter height. So over a course of seven meters horizontal, it goes up seven meters. So it's almost a, a 45 degree slope down to there. So if you put the blocks up here and you want to dig away here, and the road is down here, it could affect the integrity of, of the supporting material underneath of the blocks. So that's that's the concern. It's it's like um, building right up to the edge rather than having it set back so there'd be no structural integrity of the support of the blocks if you have zero setback. Director Lee? I, I, sorry. I, I guess I under, misunderstood then because I was assuming the wall would start at grade and go from there, but you're suggesting that it's not. It's already part way up a bank. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Director Hills, would you like to move the recommendation now as amended? Uh, yes, I would. Okay, and uh, second it. Um, sorry, do you want to second it or are you asking a question? You second it, okay, so it's seconded. Now you can ask a question. Right. Uh, yeah, I just I have a little concern too about the aesthetics, because of course Modi can take down the hedge, mm -hmm. and then the first thing you see as you're driving towards Lower Gibson's is a huge wall, and you know that's been a big uh, issue in Seashell, the Great Wall of Seashell. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Oh heavens, we can't look like Seashell. Yes. Um, so I, I I do have some concerns about it, and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an awkward process, too, because we have questions that really are Modi questions. So we're making a decision without knowing what Modi's yes. parameters on this situation are, too. Director Hiltz? Um, yeah, that, that, that concern, uh, the, the rural character um, of the area is not... Um, um, the, the potential visual impact is a seven-meter structure mm -hmm. off of grade. Um, 
and, and, and from, if I was standing there 30 years from now without that cedar hedge in front of it, I might be concerned with that. So that's kind of where, I, so yeah, I, I don't know if, can there be a covenant about having that hedge for the period of time until there's a, so th this is, yeah, I, I don't know what, typically I don't think Modi uh, looks to the community planning as a, as, as a part of their criteria. It's about moving transportation. So uh, I'm interested in exploring that with uh, Director McMahon, whether you would like to propose something about that, the future of the screening process with respect to that wall. Director McMahon? I don't think we can impose any requirements on Moti, much as we would love to, <laughs> but I, I, I think that's outside our province. Well, we have a resolution moved and seconded, and uh, obviously there's still some concerns uh, about it, so I think that uh, the aesthetics being one, uh, but uh, I, again, it's a rural vote, so I can only manage the, tra the traffic at this time, so. Mm. Director Hiltz? Uh, just to follow up, in, in terms of how would staff relay that information, like who would make the decision about the encumbrance of this wall with respect to the bike path? I'm going, would they have to refer it back to the committee in order for us to see that before it could go through. So I'm not sure if it, after they investigate whether they would have to refer back to the committee as a procedural issue. It, uh, with this resolution, it would not have to be referred back. Um, you could actually ask staff to, uh, if this resolution is, is uh, not approved, you could ask staff to, to report back in advance of making the decision. Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Staff are just discussing the, the difficulty of, um, <laughs> of, of guessing what, how Modi might be able to respond to uh, something that hasn't been engineered and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, yeah. many variables, and might suggest that um, understanding the outstanding question that the committee has about future impacts that uh, a decision on this be deferred to allow staff time to explore that question with Modi and return with more information. Thank you. So you could actually withdraw the resolution at, at, this, at this stage, I assume. Yeah, yeah. We have a vote and not approved. Director Tyes? Uh, this may be a little bit outside of the box, but I'm wondering if we could uh, also uh, just ask the applicants if they'd be, be willing to um, uh, entertain having somebody, an artist or something, uh, actually do a mural on the on the wall, or mm. commission it, uh, rather than mm. leaving it gray. But it's a <laughs> it's an idea. Yeah. Stuff for discussion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we can, Director Hiltz. Um, I, I would like to move the motion as the recommendation from staff to defer the decision until uh, further information to clarify. And before okay. it comes back to the committee. Motion to defer, seconded, seconded. Okay, all in favor of deferring? Okay, thank you, and, and then, then we would then expect to report back from staff on the issues that have been raised here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've now been sitting here for uh, an hour and 45 minutes, and uh, I'd like to take a break. So then, <laughs> five minutes, everybody? Oh, I <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we know that. <laughs>
staff recommend responding to as LRD, that SCRD, accepts the proposed RGS amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, a motion to receive the report. Moved, seconded. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. It's received. And um, discussion. That, um, this is a process that uh, we will perhaps ourselves be involved with in one day so that uh, Director Ties, would you have a comment or? Oh, sorry, Director Ties. Director I also have something to say, but. <laughs> <laughs> Director well, Ties. We'll we'll Director Hiltz go Director first. Hiltz. Uh, thanks, Director or Chair B. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, thanks, thanks, staff, for the report. It was uh, for, for me. It was uh, eye-opening. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot that there was a neighbor to our east. Yeah. Area F borders onto mm -hmm. Area D of uh, uh, SLRD, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, they have a population of 1,000, and it's 80 percent of the total SERD area. So it, it was just it was really eye-opening to go to the website and look at it and read the materials and going, I forgot all about those other yeah. regional districts mm -hmm. right beside us. So I, I, I thank them yeah. for reaching out and uh, that's that partnership of the, so yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful yeah. for this. Thank you. Now Director Ties. Yeah, I, uh, I, I know that uh, Mr. Hill, uh, Director Hills uh, did his due diligence and, and went to the website and actually did some research. And, uh, but I'm wondering if, if maybe uh, in the interest of us maybe going through this process in, in the future, um, if somebody could throw in uh, the regional growth strategy into our aero folders from the SLRD so that we can have a look through it. And then maybe um, uh, I'd also love to do a lunch and learn and just uh, as to, um, that would be my, yeah. my interest in it. Yeah. But um, first of all, I'll go to Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, on our intergovernmental meeting in November, the regional growth strategy will be a topic, and we do have a representative from the provincial government coming to talk to us about the process and what's involved and who's involved and all of those kinds of things. Okay, so that work has, yep. is being done behind the scenes already. Director Hiltz. Uh, I'd be happy to move the recommendations as stated. Seconded. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I think that's good. And obviously the uh, squamish little Regional District will be a good resource for us when we're going through our process as well and looking at their, their plan. So. Okay, uh, item number nine, uh, Annex F, Parks Planning Coordinator, Active Transportation Infrastructure Planning and Approvals on BC Highways, Ministry of Transportation. Who so will take that? Um, thank you. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair Beamish. In August, staff received a draft guide from the province for active transportation infrastructure planning and approvals on BC provincial highways. This document is part of a process along with the draft MOU brought forward in July and now um, uh, receiving further attention of codifying how regional districts can invest in active transportation improvements on Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure right of ways. Due to, due to the timing of receipt and the desire to share in a timely way, Staff have only performed a high-level review at this stage. Other uh, Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Regional Districts are also reviewing. Staff will do further review and re a report will be prepared for a future committee with comments for October anticipated. And the report today is just provided as information for the committee. Thank you. Thank you. There's a motion to receive the report. Move seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Received. Any discussion, Directors? Director Seegers first. Thank you. So recently the, the BC government came out with an um, active transportation design guide, which lays out the criteria and design elements that are to be included by Ministry of Transport when they're building roads throughout the province. And it actually looks at building active transportation infrastructure. So I'm wondering how this proposal ties into that proposal because it actually puts, has Ministry of Transport not responsible, but instead puts it back onto the regional districts. So given that the Active Transportation Design Guide lays out what we want it to lay out and would provide what we want it to do, why would we consider taking this on? Good point. Yeah. 
That's a rhetorical question, I assume. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Director McMahon. Yes, well, that was exactly where I was coming from here because it, it says several times, and I read the, um, the design guidelines, uh, it says that Modi, Modi's responsibility is to provide and maintain infrastructure for all road users. Now it's putting the onus on regional districts to initiate any infrastructure that's non-vehicle oriented. Uh, and, and to do a whole bunch of the development work. So the, the word here that comes to me is downloading. Oh, I, I'm really, really not liking the situation. I, I also had a couple of other observations about this process. Um, one of them is that the process doesn't seem to um, differentiate between small projects and large projects. And I'll give you an example is that we want to put a connector path between Mahan and Shaw, you know, along the English, English right-of-way there. And the portion that's in Area E is perhaps half a block long. It's already a, a corridor. Uh, all you'd pretty much need to do is take a little bulldozer through, throw down some crusher dust and stick up a sign. And it would have to go through this 30-step process, presumably, to do this, which is nuts. Um, and then the other thing is that there's no differentiation between um, projects on undeveloped right-of-ways or projects that are actually adjacent to roads. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that those are two different issues entirely. Uh, so, yeah, I have, I have lots of concerns, and I'll be very interested um, to know what some of the other regional districts raise as uh, concerns as well. And somebody can remind me, but is there a meeting associated with this at UBCM? Does anybody have a meeting? We're, <laughs> we're meeting with Ms. Karina. I know we are. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's one of the topics yeah, that yeah, we have in front yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of our resolutions. Yeah. The alternative, of course, is to talk to staff at UBCM who will be present at highways. And you can make those appointments at the appointment desk there at UBCM. So it's one thing to do. Director McMahon? Yeah, another question arose to me, too. Um, you know, I'm very concerned about the shoulders on Reed Road. So mm -hmm. does this mean, under this process, that it would be our responsibility to make sure that the shoulders of an unsafe, very heavily traveled road are developed? I mean, yeah. this is like, uh, I don't get it. Yeah. Certainly lots of clarification. And uh, you know, my suspicion is that what's happened over in recent years especially is that municipalities or, or regional districts have made uh, an effort to try to increase the walking trails and have approached the province, and they say, well, it's not in our time frame or agenda to do it, but hey, if you want to go ahead and do it, and then municipalities are saying, well, we don't have the funds to do it or the, or, or the ability to do it. And so now they're saying, well, you've you got this gas tax money, and uh, we'll, 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 let you, we'll let you come and work on our, on our property. And, and it takes the onus off them, as you say, to plan and to, to do it. So, they, so Director McMahon? Back to undeveloped road right of ways, there's a long history of yeah. beach accesses, yeah. right? And that has been quite yeah. an established and successful program. So there should be something similar to that for undeveloped road right of way. Director Pratt? Yeah. And I just, I think it's asinine that we are, as, a, as local governments, um, having to put in, um, having to put in shoulders on highways, mm -hmm. um, on provincial roadways, and just so that it's wide enough yeah. to, people can put a bike on. So, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of pushback on, I, I'd, I'd like to push back on Modi a bit on yeah. what they're, yeah. what they're downloading to us, so. Director Lee? I I agree with all the comments, mm -hmm. except that I keep going back to the idea that the original active transportation um, pathways were, were made for big cities mm -hmm. where they had, they actually were separate from the road and they wandered through parks mm -hmm. and they got where you wanted and it was kind of like a, actually an rural experience that we have on the side of our road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
they were on the hook for building those paths, not Modi. Um, we're asking Modi to provide us with a corridor so we can do the same thing. Um, so I'm not entirely unsympathetic mm. when it comes to other than major highways. Major highways I understand completely. Uh, but when you start getting into little goat paths that connect two communities, perhaps we need to work with them and if we yeah. can figure out how to build them and they agree to maintain them because they're hooked to their roads, it's not a bad compromise. So that's where my mind was when I read mm -hmm. it. So, okay. Director McMahon? And, uh, my other question was about um, active transportation access to new subdivisions that, uh, for instance, there's that one going along Castle Road in Area E that I've been meaning to talk to staff about, but it should have uh, a pedestrian bike connector as mm -hmm. part of that subdivision, and that's Modi's responsibility, presumably, but do they have a best practice for that? Do they have, do they have a policy of, you know, providing suitable corridors or making sure that developers provide suitable corridors? Because uh, we're stuck, certainly in Area E, we're stuck with a lot of subdivisions where you have somebody having to walk all the way around, you know, a ridiculous length just because no corridor was ever yeah. put in place. And it's kind of crazy. No, I agree. It, um, some of the areas like uh, Gibson's, we're actively trying to find uh, uh, those uh, pathways and take them from developers as, as they develop. One of the best places I've seen of that, the community I've worked in, is, uh, is Masset. You can walk uh, anywhere in the community of Masset uh, without having to walk on the, on the roads because when they planned it out, they laid these corridors out and, uh, and they provided spaces uh, between lots and uh, uh, between, uh, between blocks uh, for, for staying off the road so, they, so that um, – and kids can get to school without going on the roads. That was interesting. So. But that takes planning and that takes uh, foresight and policy and also it takes the, the knowledge that you can actually request the developer to provide that land. I mean, if you, if you look at what's happening in the subdivision that I'm in is parkland. We have um, pathway and trail that goes right around parkland. Now the area on um, – uh, in the industrial park is being developed. That developer is responsible to connect parkland uh, through to the um, – uh, through to the highway, essentially, uh, so that uh, I can walk anywhere, including to the rec center, and all I'll have to do is cross Park Road uh, to do that. So it's important to be able to have those kind of uh, uh, trails, uh, and, and more so because we're getting more people in our area who, not, who are now on these electrified carts and uh, different uh, things of that nature so they can also stay off the roads and the road shoulder. So, But that's a planning objective, and the planners do a good job with that when they have that opportunity. Okay, have we discussed this enough? Yeah, we, we know that we have concerns, so we move on. As we've received the report. We have no recommendations arising from it, so uh, we can move to Annex G uh, with agreement, and that is Crab Road Beach Access Enhancement Opportunities. And uh, again, we're enhancing Modi's Road right away. So, okay. <laughs> so, so Rebecca Port, welcome, and uh, take your chances. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Beamish. In January 2019, the FCRD Board adopted a resolution for staff to research, with neighborhood participation, opportunities to enhance the Crab Road Beach Access, a Ministry of Transportation right-of-way located in Half Moon Bay. This beach access currently includes a road end, rocky shoreline, and a walkway to a bench. SCRD has held the permit to maintain the beach access since 2002. Past efforts at shoreline improvements have had limited success due to the challenging nature of the location, with no improvements to the shoreline being sought in recent years. The goal of the current process was to work within the constraints of the site and determine if there are specific improvements to the Crab Road right-of-way that are desirable at this time. Staff developed an online questionnaire requesting feedback and sent letters to 65 homes within the vicinity of Crab Road, inviting them to two site meetings to explore ideas. Approximately 30 people attended meetings, 29 responded to the questionnaire, and comments were also received through phone calls, emails, and individual meetings. 
Specifics of the feedback are listed in the report. The majority of the feedback stated a desire to limit change. Three improvements that were most supported included posting a sign about etiquette, removal of dead trees and debris, and consulting with Modi regarding possible encroachment onto the right-of-way by neighbors and strategies to better define the boundaries between public and private land. Thank you for your report. Could I have a uh, motion to receive the report? Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Director Pratt, I'll turn to you first. Um, no specific comments at this time. Um, I thank staff for the outreach that they've uh, uh, that they've done on this, and um, I'm I'm happy to move the recommendations unless there's any other comments or questions. Okay, moved, seconded. Uh, are you seconding or are you providing comment? Okay. Um, I, I just want to echo um, yeah. uh, what Director Pratt is saying about the precision about how many people were consulted and, and that level of detail rather than just a group of homes. I can understand 65 and I go that's a significant contribution of, of consultation in that area so I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, do we have a seconder? Seconded? Um, okay, further discussion? All in favor of the recommendation? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Um, moving on to Annex H, which is item 11 on our agenda. And this is the Egmont School, um, Egmont Park License Agreement with School District 46. Uh, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Since 1998, SCRD has operated through a license agreement, a park on the Egmont School site, a property owned by SD46. The site is the only SCRD park in the Egmont area and uh, by all accounts is well liked by area residents. The license agreement recently expired and staff are seeking direction on renewal of the license agreement. SD46 has indicated a, a desire to see the arrangement continue and staff recommend that the delegated authorities be authorized to execute uh, a new license to occupy the area for a further five-year term. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Motion to receive the report. Moved. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Um, recommendation to uh, authorize the license agreement between SCRD and School District 46 to be approved, approved signed by designated authorities. Okay. Question. Director Seegers. Thank you. On page uh, 103, it indicates that we're looking, as you indicated in, in the recommendation, five years, and previously it was 20 years. Hmm. Can staff comment on that and why we're only looking at five years at this point? Mr. Hall. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just checking my memory. Although we have held the, uh, we've held an arrangement for the park since 1998, I believe it has been consecutive five-year terms. Thank you. Director Seegers? Sorry, Director Tyes? Yeah, I, uh, uh, also on page 103 it says is that in the medium and uh, uh, and long term that there's going to be some removal and replacement of playgrounds, fences, and tennis courts and all that. And uh, I saw that in the original construction of the park that uh, there was a community fundraiser to actually uh, build the uh, playground in the first place. And so I'm wondering if uh, such a process could be repeated but or if that is now no longer an option that, that the SCRD is taking care of this property. Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question, Director. Uh, so uh, firstly, in terms of process, uh, SCRD is developing asset management plans for all services. Parks, the Park Service does not currently have a completed asset management and capital plan. Uh, so rather, things are planned on the basis of routine inspections and uh, um, without a long-term forecast. Um, in ter when, when a capital need arises, it's typically dealt with through the annual budgeting process rather than an ongoing 
commitment to capital funding as is the case in some other services. And at the time that a capital project uh, is brought forward, opportunities for grants and partnerships are always explored. And SCRD has benefited greatly from, uh, from community partnerships, including the, the historic one at this site, but also for other uh, playgrounds in other uh, rural areas. And that would certainly be the case, that those opportunities would be explored uh, if a future uh, need emerged. The infrastructure that is in this park right now is not at the end of its life, but um, staff raise it as an implication of continuing to remain involved on the site, that at some point those needs will come to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Buman? Yes, just further to the parks asset management plan, I'm just wondering uh, when that is forecast to be happening. Mr. Hall? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, this, this is a, a, a question of corporate priorities, and so at the moment our, our, our efforts in uh, improving our and, and following through on our asset management strategy are focused uh, particularly on our wastewater infrastructure. I understand that parks is kind of in the next tranche, and uh, the Parks team is actively getting ready with updating asset inventories, and the type of pre-work that's required for that work. Thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. Page 103, under financial implications. Last sentence in the first paragraph says, no additional financial implications are anticipated. Given what's in the following two paragraphs, is that referring to just our arrangement with the school district? Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. So there are no, f no uh, additional financial implications associated with continuing to operate and manage the park as it stands now. Um, staff don't forecast that substantial capital uh, requirements exist in the next few years based on, during the term of the, the renewed license, uh, based on the condition of the park as it stands and current our current park uh, service standards. And should that change, um, then as, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, staff would bring forward that, uh, that need for the committee's consideration through a budgeting process. And it would form a, a separate um, uh, financial discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, a recommendation uh, uh, that the uh, authorizing the lease agreement between SCRD and school district 46 be signed, uh, moved, uh, seconded. All in favor? Approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on now to um, item 12, Annex I, the um, uh, purchase of a contract for the uh, word of the purchase of an electric ice resurfacer. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair Beamish. The ice resurfacer, or more popularly known as <coughs> Zamboni, at the Sunshine Coast Arena is due for renewal and has been planned to be replaced in SCRD's recreation capital plan. RFQ 19381 was issued and two proposals were received. And staff would note that there are uh, only a few, uh, perhaps three or four, companies that manufacture such equipment. Uh, on the basis of meeting specifications and best price, staff recommend the supply contract be awarded to Kendrick Equipment. The new equipment is electric, and so it will have a, a modest reduction in emissions uh, while also contributing to higher indoor air quality in the arena. And the bid received is within the approved capital plan budget, uh, and the equipment can be in service in January 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive the report. Moved. Seconded. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Director Seegers. I was going to move all the recommendations as presented and then make a comment that I highlighted the sentence where it said it's an electric vehicle. Yes. And I figured <laughs> Director McMahon would be pleased with that. Yeah. So all, yeah. all the recommendations as presented. Yeah. Move the recommendations. Yeah. Seconded. Seconded. Discussion? Director Lamb? I was just wondering, is this the same vehicle, uh, I'm just wondering if there's uh, interchangeable parts between the one in Gibson's and this machine. Mm. Staff? 
<laughs> the tires? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure that this is exactly the same. However, um, I am aware that the, uh, the maintenance and servicing requirements for uh, both, uh, both ice resurfacers can be completed by the same uh, service technician which is a benefit uh, from an operating perspective to SERD. Thank you. Director Hiltz. Uh, thanks, Chair Beamish. Uh, the question is about the, the solid waste management of the existing or the replacement. What happens to that chunk of metal? Mr. Hall. Uh, thank, thank you for the question, Chair. So uh, SERD would follow our asset disposition process and relieve ourselves of of that asset uh, through an appropriate process. Likely, uh, I would speculate that that involves uh, sending it to an auction along with other okay. SCRD vehicles and equipment. Thank you. Director McMahon. Yes, I just wanted to say that I hope there's an opportunity for a solar recharging station for our electric <laughs> Zamboni. <Hey>. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to call. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call the question. All in favor? And thank you. And thank you very much for your report. Okay. Okay. New staff. New team. Okay. Okay. We're moving now to the item 13, Annex J, which is the uh, um, request for quotations uh, for a contract award for waste. Wood waste hauling and disposal service. And uh, I will turn to Mr. Kumar. Thank you. The, uh, the intent of the interim wood waste removal is to secure hauling and processing of all the clean wood waste from Pender Harbor and Seashell Landfill. This is an interim measure to address the accumulated stockpile at both sites. In order to seek any interested and qualified companies to provide this service, an RFQ was issued on August 6th. Proponents were evaluated against availability, price, and environmental considerations. Celeste Environmental Group Inc. met the specifications as outlined in the RFQ and are the best value to deal with the waste stream. Therefore, staff recommend that the contract for wood waste hauling and disposal service be awarded to Celeste Environmental Group, Inc. Staff also recommend that this contract award for wood waste hauling and disposal service be forwarded to this afternoon board's board meeting for adoption consideration as we are looking to start the hauling within two weeks. Staff would be pleased to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you, sir, for your report. Um, motion received the report. Moved, seconded. Um, all in favor? Thank you. Discussion? Director Seegers. All of the recommendations as presented on page 107 with the addition that it go forward to the board this afternoon. Okay. Uh, second. Seconded. Discussion? Mr. Hiltz? Uh, yeah, just a question for staff. Is the purchasing policy the new procurement policy that we just went through in July, is, is this, was this under the new one or the old one? Staff? I think given the timing of this, I think it was um, more the old one. Yeah. Any further questions? Director Lee? Uh, when uh, when they're finished with the uh, waste, um, do we know what they're going to do with it? Is it going to be buried? Is it going to be burnt? Is it going to be sold? Uh, just kind of curious. Mr. Kumar. Thank you for your question, Chair. Um, what Solar Soils is looking to do is they're looking um, to grind it up and then provide it to House Sound Pulp and Paper. Um, so this is basically a trial run of their main contract, which they had pr proposed um, for, for long-term wood waste hauling. Okay, thank you. Um, see no further questions, call a question. All in favor? 
Oppose, seeing none, thank you. Thank you for your report. Thank you. We'll move now to item 14, Annex K on the agenda. And uh, welcome Robin Cooper. And we're going to discuss um, the Clean Plastics BC Action Plan Policy Consultation Paper Response. And um, Robin, I'll let you take it, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Beamish. The SCRD sent a letter to Minister Heyman of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy in June uh, regarding support for prov province-wide regulations on single-use plastics. The SCRD received a response from Minister Heyman in August, and he suggested that the SCRD provide feedback on the recently released Clean BC Plastics Action Plan Policy Consultation Paper. Uh, so staff have prepared um, and drafted a response letter as feedback to that paper, and it's included as attachment B. And staff recommend that the draft letter be finalized and be sent to the ministry. And staff are pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you very much for your report. First of all, motion to receive the report. Moved, seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Um, discussion of the report. And um, where are we going to go? Director, Director DeMann. I, I just uh, had an observation about the letter. The fourth paragraph, uh, the second sentence is a little tortured and it, and it uh, drizzles off without a period. Uh, and I also like the part where um, uh, diary containers do not have uh, <laughs> deposits <laughs> on them. <laughs> uh, yeah, the question I had is, uh, how does our – did the, um, the, le the submission from Tofino and Squamish come after we drafted this letter? Like, how, how, how do those two things uh, relate to each other? Are, are you familiar with the submission from Tofino and Squamish? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, we received the response from Minister Heyman suggesting that the SRD reply right. prior to receiving okay. the letter from Squamish and Tofino, but given the timeliness of this with the September 30th deadline, uh, it was included for correspondence okay. for consideration at the same time as this report. Um, other discussion? Director Lee? I was a little concerned about throwing our support behind things like um, flotation ban in uh, docks without having a clear understanding of what the alternative would be. I wonder if the alternative is worse than the cure. Um, for instance, we talked about uh, encapsulated foam being banned, but the alternative is plastic tanks. <laughs> what happens to the plastic tanks? So I, we seem to be responding to a theory <laughs> as opposed to saying something about the fact that we'd like to ensure effective alternatives were available. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what my thought process was. So, thank you. Thank you. Any comment? Director Pratt? It's, it's certainly a fair comment, Director Lee. Um, however, I mean, we, we used to see single-use plastics, plastics bags as being a solution to other problems, and uh, they've just created more than what they are. Um, it, it's, uh, I think we've got to start somewhere, and we know the issue that the, styro that the, the styrofoam has in the, in the lakes and oceans, and encapsulated, yes, is one way of, of um, but there has to be a better way, and there has been a better way in the past before plastic was invented, um, or there was a different way, and uh, yeah, a log, right, mm. uh, float on a log, um, and I would, um, I think going forward with this letter, and as well as looking at the correspondence that we have from the joint correspondence from Squamish and Tofino later in the agenda, I think um, supporting, having our own letter going forward, as well as supporting the joint letter, um, and um, I think these are things we have to do. We need to have a, as much of a unified voice as possible, as well as our individual voice. So everywhere, 
or every place that we can um, say, look, we need, to we need to figure this out and mm -hmm. the province needs to do better at what they're doing because we're trying to do everything we can. Further discussion? Well, there's a recommendation that the uh, draft response letter included in attachment B be approved or amended and sent to Mr. Heyman and further this recommendation be forwarded to the regular board meeting of September 12, 2019. Uh, some move, move over the recommendation first. Is there any moved? Okay, second, seconded. Discussion? Do discussion or are you voting? Discussion. <laughs> Director McMahon. I'd like us to fix our tortured sentence. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, table, yeah. yeah. For, yeah. for example, the contents of a drink container should not affect where it can and cannot be accepted for a recycling period. Um, as well, com comma, some drink containers have a deposit where others, such as dairy containers, do not, period. Okay. Okay, with that wordsmithing and amendment, is, uh, are we prepared for the question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, all in favor? Thank you. Opposed? Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll now move on to uh, minutes of uh, meetings and uh, I want to look through some of these because several of these contain recommendations and we need to look and consider whether or not those recommendations need to be approved by the board um, to go forward. So the first one is Annex L and that's the um, uh, Policing Committee and uh, first of all a motion to receive. Moved, seconded, all in favor, thank you. Now recommendations, are there, are there recommendations out of this that need to be um, moved by this board. Um, the uh, recommendation, yeah. yep, Director Pratt. Um, just one housekeeping note first. Uh, uh, Sue Gerard was not at that meeting. No, she wasn't. She wasn't at either policing or transportation, but she was, uh, the, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then otherwise, there was one recommendation that will. I believe it was number six. Yes, yeah. that uh, we need to. Um, Pull out and uh, and discuss whether or not we bring it fo yeah. forward yeah. Uh, regarding the letter to the Treasury Board for RCMP living subsidies. So I would like to move forward that recommendation, please. Okay, move move that we write a letter to the Treasury Board or draft the RCMP. Moved by by Director Prack, second seconded. All in favor? Okay, and then we have items uh, seven and eight as well. That is on page one thirty nine. Um, Director Seeger, do you have a question? No, I'd like to speak to Recommendation 7. Okay, 7, yeah. Uh, this is becoming more of an issue day by day in Seashell particularly, but I also know that Pender Harbor, I believe, has some vehicles now stored at their fire department in their yard. Um, so we have a number of um, RVs that are being used mm -hmm. by some of the homeless on the Sunshine Coast. They've been given them, they're turning into party uh, places and not being uh, dealt with properly. So we need to figure out a way for how we can not only store them somewhere, but dispose of them in a, a, a method that isn't too costly to the owner. Um, I note that this refers to staff that uh, recommend that staff investigate. Is this in concert with the municipalities? Yes, as well, and the RCMP. And the RCMP, okay. That understood in the re re recommendation. Director Lee? <laughs> 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 I saw it. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> I need it too. <laughs> um, in, in Pender, um, we had several unsightly uh, issues that we were attempting to resolve. So we have talked to our fire department. Um, our fire department's its own fire protection business. Um, they, they were willing to uh, take vehicles and use them for practice. So they chop them up, and when they're finished chopping them up, they throw them in a bin and take them away. Um, so we've actually towed one there. But the, uh, the whole issue is that we need a policy 
for all situations mm. because we have a situation of abandon on the side of uh, Modi right away, abandon on forestry roads and uh, and cars, trucks and trailers and RVs. Um, so you, you need to meet with all of those people when you're trying to work through a process. <laughs> yeah. Modi, the police and whoever you're going to get to store and tow. Um, I am finding that cars and trucks in um, more urban areas such as C. Shelton Gibson's are not really a problem if you can get ownership. Yes. Uh, because uh, they're close to the uh, recycler, so the tow truck will just grab it and tow yeah, it. Right. But uh, as Darnelda was mentioning with RVs, it's a different issue because it's almost like destroying a boat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I haven't quite figured out how to do that one yet. So, Director Hills. Uh, yeah, my, my recollection, it, it was about the, a compound for those vehicles that there is not an alternative right now. That was where the focus was. And, and the RVs was that there is no one willing to take it, like a bypass wouldn't take no. it. So it was about an, an alter, the, the, the right. difficult to manage ones. That was, that was my recollection. Director Ties. Uh, I personally like the, uh, the notion that was discussed uh, at the policing committee meeting, and that is that maybe in the future, um, I know this year is too late, but we could have an AVICC or UBCM resolution saying that ICBC should uh, uh, identify the last, last registered owner of, of this vehicle and, and if possible, uh, make them responsible for the disposable of it. Um, you know, I, I don't think it should be that hard because you have a VIN number, and at some point it was, yeah. um, it was uh, registered, and um, and I, I don't. I think that's a bit of a loophole that should be closed. Director Seegers. They are being sold. Mm -hmm. yeah, for a dollar or yeah. ten dollars yeah. or. Well, they should register it then. But they're not. I, I, the last yeah. 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 I personally agree with Director Tyes. If you have a uh, speeding ticket, uh, sooner or later it's going to be collected when you go and do your insurance, re redo your insurance. A parking ticket is going to be collected at, uh, by ICBC. Why can't we collect against the charge of the cost of municipal disposal <laughs> or government disposal of a vehicle that's been abandoned? Put it back to the last owner. They come in, and, and the onus is on them to provide a bill of sale to ICBC. They could then transfer that cost to another uh, person with a driver's license or, or a registered owner. I, mean, I, I think we're missing the boat here. Is that these are registered vehicles, and uh, and you can find that VIN number somewhere. Or at least Bypass Auto will find it for you if nobody else. So, um, Director Lee. Um, it is true, and there is a process of taking ownership. Yeah. Um, it, it involves locating the uh, VIN and uh, uh, letter to the owner yeah. in w some instances. In other instances, if it's abandoned in Modi right away, it's a 30, it's a 72-hour notice, and uh, you can yeah. take ownership. So take that's but the, the key thing to anything we do is to make sure there's a financial penalty back to the person that was the last registered owner yep. of whatever it is. And it looks like uh, calling abandonment without a license plate, uh, there's a $500 fine for littering. <laughs> so if you, if you uh, make it such that they have a choice of grabbing it and disposing of it or paying for that fine, it would probably stop other people from doing it, which I think is really what our objective is, yeah. is to stop it from happening. Director Pratt. Um, do we have a motion? We don't have a motion no. on the floor right now. But what I would like to do so we don't lose this is make a motion that we bring forward this um, to AVICC and UBCM for 2020. Bring it forward as a motion to uh, regarding abandoned vessels just so we don't lose it and staff doesn't lose it. And so we ha then we have that we bring forward a motion on abandoned vessels or abandoned yeah, vessels, yes, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> abandoned yeah, vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and looking for a source yeah. or, or looking for yeah. support from the province, but that way we don't lose it. Yeah. Seconded by Director Ties. All in favor of that motion? Hmm. 
And we do have the motion, though, the recommendation in the package, then. Does somebody want to move that recommendation? Uh, and we're adding the words in concert with um, municipalities. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, moved by uh, Director Seegers, seconded. All in favor? Okay. The next recommendation is number eight, and that is a uh, meeting with UBCM at UBCM with staff to discuss RCMP staffing for rural areas. Um, this is will be going to the game, to going to the uh, the meeting, the, the appointment desk at UBCM, and, and arranging a meeting that uh, during sometime during UBCM. And uh, who would like to move that? And then who? Would, then we need to talk about who is going to take that initiative. Director Seegers, Director Pratt, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor on that? Okay. So, so who's going to action this at UBCM? Director Seegers, Director Pratt. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Okay. We're moving next to the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, Annex M. And uh, first of all, motion to receive. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, recommendations arising out of this. Um, um, we have we have uh, recommendation number two is a park and ride uh, recommendation. Um, the Transportation Advisory Committee recommend that a report titled "Park and Ride Option B." Oh, sorry, that park and ride. I guess that's just discussion. Um, anything there that needs to be actioned uh, specifically? Item seven, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee recommend that a speed service. Sorry, Director McMahon. Sorry, yeah. almost there. Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, staff would suggest that uh, a board decision on the end that uh, portion of recommendation number two would be helpful to guiding next steps. Thank you. And that park and ride facility location design be explored with the community in 2019-2020 as part of a plan survey to research, research to update future transit properties, plan pro priorities. Priorities. Um, Director McMahon. Yeah, I think it could use a little clarification because I'm not. Uh, I'm presuming that this would be transit that would be actioning this. Um, uh, Director Hilt sent me a 2011 report on park and ride options, um, which was sort of entertaining because I couldn't, th th almost all the suggested spots were not spots that we have any control over. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the parking lot at Cedar Grove Elementary School, I'm sure that they would love to have people mm -hmm. <laughs> park in, in the school grounds. So, uh, yeah, are we bunting this to transit, I guess, is the question here. What's the, what's the most appropriate way to move this forward? Staff, do you have a suggestion on, on that? Thank you, Chair. Uh, BC Transit is uh, not, uh, it's out of your scope of work to work on park and ride. However, the idea is, and a further report will be part of um, uh, next week's um, infrastructure services agenda to uh, have them do survey work in the community and we can partner up with them to ensure that park and ride questions are included in that survey. Thank you. Okay, Director Seegers. So clarification from staff. So what you're requesting is that we just pass this recommendation as presented or is there some other information you? Thank you. Yeah. It can be uh, passed as presented. That would be enough direction to us to include it in uh, any work we do okay. on that survey so moving moved. forward. Okay. Director okay. Singer moved it. Seconded. All in favor? Okay. That's approved. Thank you. Um, I had marked item seven, and that's the Transportation Advisory Committee recommend that a speed survey be requested by the SCRD for the portion of Sunshine Coast Highway near the Wood Creek Park area. Now, I'm trying to remember the letter from Minister Trevina. I thought she indicated in there that they were going to do a speed survey, but I don't recall specifically. Don't have that letter in front of me. Does anybody? But doesn't mean we can't uh, request it. Director Seegers? 
Sorry, this came out of a conversation we had at the meeting with yeah. Ministry of Transport at the meeting. Yes. Where they said that we uh, could actually request oh, that they okay. do this. Yeah. In rereading this, though, what I what I recall from the meeting was they said they would do they would look at the speed that traffic actually went yeah. in the area and then advise as to what it should be based on what people generally yeah. uh, traveled, you know, how fast they traveled. I don't think that's what we want. No. We want them to reduce the speed. Reduce the speed. We don't care what the speed yeah. survey comes up yeah. with. We want them to reduce the speed. Yeah. So yeah. why are we asking them to do a speed survey if we just want them to reduce it? I was thinking of a similar thing myself, that, that, that looking at a speed survey and talking about how fast people are going and they're, they're, they're flying, even though it's an 80 zone, they're only doing 60, so we don't need to change it. I would rather know what the speed a vehicle was going at the time they had an accident uh, because that's recreation um, investigation by the RCMP, especially when there's a fatality involved. They always do come up with that so that they're doing – now, if they're doing 90 in the 80s, we, we know we have a problem. So that, uh, um, But, yeah, I think we can request the, request the sur speed survey, and um, um, it will choose. But, uh, I mean, uh, we recommend, the town has recommended the speed there redu be reduced to 60, at that between the continuation between the 60 zone as you leave Gibson's and at least the Roberts Creek intersection. Director Seegers? Mm -hmm. Follow up. If you go up above the recommendation, it says that we could request a speed survey, and then the speed limit is set at the 85th yeah. percentile. So right now, the speed is set at 80. So 80. we're not going to get people driving 60 yeah. in there. So then they're going to come back and tell us that they'll set at 85th percentile based on what they've got. Yeah. It's not what we want. Yeah. It's not going to give us the information. Yeah. It's not going to give yeah. us the no. result that we want. Yeah. And you do sometimes get a slower speed, especially when you've got a long ferry, ferry line going through there occasionally. But it, uh, occasionally, <laughs> but it, it, that still does not preclude people from doing these speed limits Sorry, or higher. Sorry, this cut it off. Can we find some, some people who have time, some <laughs> old people who can get out there and drive really slow? <laughs> So do we, do we want to just reinforce the uh, request we've already made, uh, at least Gibbs has already made, and that is that uh, we request it be reduced to 60 uh, at that point. <laughs> Director McMahon. The explanation that Modi gave at that meeting, as far as I could figure out, was that they could do whatever they really wanted yeah. because they had, it, they, they had us coming and going, and they don't want to change the speed limit, so it doesn't really matter what the result of the speed survey is. So I'm inclined to agree with you. Um, I think maybe at the next uh, TAC meeting, we could raise the question of where, uh, of, of the traffic volume, right? Because yeah. that corridor there, there is no alternate route. So yeah. all of the traffic goes through there, whereas Modi right now is monitoring traffic volumes um, by uh, near Roberts Creek yeah. Road, um, which, you know, at that point there are alternate routes around. So I don't think it's a, a very accurate reflection of the real traffic volume. Director Hiltz? Yeah, so it, it, we're, it sounds like really the committee is looking for data in, in some ways. And, and so could it be returned back to the committee to actually firm up what we were trying to talk about then? Director McMahon? I think that's a good idea. We can refer this back to the committee because I think the intent of the committee was to get ammunition to support lowering the speed limit, but my read on the way it was is that it won't help our case. So. Motion to refer? No, okay. <laughs> Director, Director Pratt. I had honestly preferred to uh, support the town of Gibsons and request a reduction in speed to 60 kilometers per hour in this area. I don't think it needs to go back to committee. I think let's just authorize, let's ask the board to send a letter. Okay. Move, seconded. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Okay, move forward on that one. Recommendation number eight, bottom of 143, integrated transportation study. Uh, recommend that 2011 integrated transportation be circulated to TAC members and included as an agenda item for discussion at the October 17th. Um, I don't
don't know that needs other action or that it could almost just be direction on that. Director Pratt? I just have a question on whether or not we have an update on the MOTI corridor review. Staff? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Staff have not received any further information uh, since uh, what was shared at the Transportation Advisory Committee in July. Thank you. Director Pratt? So to clarify, that information is, is that we are still sitting in phase one waiting for the parameters of the study to occur. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. okay. <sighs> so um, somebody just want to move uh, recommendation number eight? Move Director Seegers, seconded, all in favor? That will go back to transportation. Director Seegers, you had a comment? Uh, this is another topic. Yep. Page 141. 141. Yes, 141. One, two, three, four. Fourth bullet under recommendation four. So we're, we're looking at potential park and rides to help deal with the ferry uh, parking situation during construction. Um, I did talk with a landowner in Seashout who is willing to be one of these sites. So I don't know what this process is to move something like that forward at this point. That'd be a fancy staff question. How do we deal with this? It's BC Ferries that was looking but for the- BC Ferries the in touch with the owner or I, how, does, how does that work? Yeah. I would think that would be a first step because we're not gonna take on BC Ferries responsibility here, but if there's a willing owner to, to uh, do that, maybe the BC Ferries is going to support that financially. and. Yeah, I think referred, yeah. Yeah, so staff can provide contact info. I can put the two yeah. parties together. Okay. Yeah. okay, are we finished with, with that? Okay, moving to the Agricultural Advisory Committee meeting, July 23rd. A number of recommendations in there as well. Recommendation number two was emergency planning for farmers with livestock. Recommended information regarding emergency planning for farmers and people of livestock be provided to the Agricultural Land Committee for our future meeting. Any, or somebody want to move that, give staff direction to do that? Moved. Oh, sorry, question, Director Seegers. Thank you. On page 148, the Agricultural Advisory Committee is recommending that that motion go forward. My concern is this is, only, this is one of the products, I think only one of the, the only product to deal with some of the invasive species that we have. So if we, if we actually ban it, how do we deal with those? Uh, process issue, we have two recommendation number twos. That's right, yeah. And yeah. yeah. Well, we should so amend, the, amend the minutes to uh, reflect that on page 148 is actually recommendation number three. Okay. So that's for recommendation number three. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So um, you were you were speaking to recommendation number three. Your question was that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and did you want to change that recommendation or? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't know of any other product yeah. that can be used on these these invasive species at this time. So I. I mean, while I, I don't like them being elsewhere, I'm totally okay with that. I don't necessarily want to have them banned because I don't know what else we'd use. Yeah, staff, sorry, Mr. Hall. Um, just to add to the discussion, Chair, um, this item was brought up as a very late addition to the July 23rd Agricultural Advisory uh, Committee meeting, and it was presented as a notice of motion. Staff did clarify uh, that the timing for the reference TBCM convention was not, uh, did not fit, and, um, and so the motion as presented in the, uh, in the uh, minutes here is just to return it to, to have it return to the committee for further discussion. There, there isn't a recommendation at this time coming forward from the AAC to this committee okay. for a particular action. Thank okay. you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. 
Uh, going back then to recommendation number two and 147, again, just giving staff direction to provide the uh, moved, second. Okay, you have a comment? Yeah. I just thought, um, not sure how we action this, but to invite our new emergency planning coordinator to come and speak to uh, a, f a future AAC meeting would be the appropriate thing to do. Okay. Um, to the AAC? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to add that to this recommendation? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Mover agree? Okay. And then Director McMahon seconded it. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Annex O. Um, this is the Egmont uh, Advisory Planning Commission. Is there anything arising out of that, um, Director Lee? Did you want a recommendation on? Okay. Motion to receive. Sorry, motion. First, first of all, motion to receive. Uh, the uh, board moved, uh, seconded. All in favor? Thank, thank you, Director Hall. A comment. Uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, back to page 148. Our amended recommendation number, or the amended listing of it as recommendation number three. Yes. Um, I, I may have overstated my uh, um, my, my clarification a little. Uh, the committee. Uh, today is it would be helpful to staff if the committee today decided uh, provided direction to staff whether or not they would like the AAC to consider this motion at their next meeting. Glycophate to the ban. Yeah. So yep. would would the committee uh, like to see uh, this receive further discussion at the next AAC meeting? Thank you. Um, Director McMahon. There. Uh, my uh, impression was that the intent was to ban the retail sale of glyphosate, not the actual use of glyphosate, which is two different issues. And um, some clarification would be helpful because uh, an overall ban, as has been pointed out, is, is probably excessive. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can certainly refer it back to the... Um, AAC, I'd be in favor of that. Director Hiltz? Um, and in terms of the the agricultural aspect of the terms or reference of the committee, this almost seemed like it was outside of the agricultural aspect. So I, I, I'd like a little bit of clarification. Is, is this within their terms of reference to deal with retail sales, which is, it's not even mentioning agriculture. It's about, so I, I have... Are they going into the weeds a little bit on glyphosate opposed to the agricultural aspects of it? Okay. Director McMahon? Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point to discuss too, but I think one of the concerns was, uh, for instance, if you're on ALR and you are trying to farm organically and your neighbors are spraying glyphosate everywhere, then you have a problem, and it's the fact that it's not regulated and it's sold real retail that makes it possible for them to do that. So, sort of in the mandate, sort of. Director Hiltz? So we could specify that the recommendation is about the re relevance to agriculture opposed to um, th that's where they need to focus is how this glyphosate affects agriculture and organic farming. That's where they should be focusing their discussions then. I'm not sure we need to direct their discussion. I think we'll just throw it back at them and see how it goes. Director Seegers? And I think Director McMahon and Director Hiltz attend those meetings and can bring the, the board's concerns forward. Any further discussion of that? So that do we need a recommendation passed then? Is that what you're looking for, Mr. Hall? So a recommendation that this be referred back to the moved and seconded and all in favor okay thank you referred back so okay and going then uh, we we did receive the um, Egmont uh, advisory committee minutes and nothing anything arising from there director Lee that needs a resolution um, no I uh, I think these uh, comments just go back to the uh, the staff that are mm -hmm. compiling the recommendations so okay 
Thank you. I don't think we um, need to accept them or anything like that. Just, just the fact we, I guess we accept the minutes. It's we accept the minutes, that's right, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the um, uh, next one is Roberts Creek Advisory Planning. Um, and again, requesting that uh, be reviewed. Is there any, are there any, what are some matters we've discussed here? And that was that uh, with regards to recommendation number four, was it, that we refer that back to staff for, for review and uh, a report? Mr. Hall, do you recall that conversation? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. As a matter of process, um, the committee will recall that at the time that the BC Timber Sales five-year operating plan was brought forward with staff analysis, uh, there was direction to refer it to advisory planning commissions, and uh, for a number of the rural areas, those, that referral has now taken place, and there are comments included in minutes. Um, Staff would recommend as a next step that a summary with analysis of the Advisory Planning Commission comments on the BCTS operating plan 2019-23 be brought uh, to an October committee meeting and um, further that that recommendation be forwarded to the regular board meeting today to allow for that process to follow through in a timely way. Thank you. Okay. And, um, Director McMahon, you move that? Director Ty has seconded. And are you clear on the uh, right resolution? Okay. So all in favor? Any discussion, rather? All in favor? Okay. It's done. Thank you. Have you moved to the agenda today? No, um, oh, sorry. Director Ty, sorry. Um, recommendation number one <coughs> was also in re regards to the BC Timber Sales Operations Plan. And I'm just uh, – and. The recommendation one says that the Roberts Creek Advisory Planning Commission recommends that Upper Roberts Creek be designated as a community watershed. I'm, I'm wondering, um, can we do that? And uh, secondly, um, uh, would this be uh, also as part of what recommendation number four encompasses for next year's uh, for next month's committee meeting, or is that a separate issue? Staff, how do you see that? Thank you, Chair. Uh, community watersheds are um, administrated and regulated under provincial regulation, the Forest Range Practices Act, and that's how they are established. Uh, it's by uh, the minister, I think, it's, uh, himself uh, uh, points them. And they are only for community water sources where there is a single or two water licenses uh, or more, multiple, where they must be for uh, community water supply. So they are not intended at the moment. The legislation does not allow for a community watershed to be established to protect uh, residential sources. Um, uh, sources that are used for residential water supply. Hence the recommendation uh, at that time uh, in the discussion staff report was also to include that uh, request in a letter to the minister that the community watersheds uh, would be uh, designation would be broadened to also allow for these kind of um, watersheds uh, that are important for residential water supply to be protected. So, yeah, yeah, I guess that um, uh, answers my questions, and there's something moving in that direction, and so that's good. Director McMahon? Just to process thing, did we re move receipt of all of the APC minutes? We did? Good. Well, we, we, each time we're moving receipt, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion of um, APC minutes? Uh, for area D, area F, uh, West Tau Sound, APC minute. First of all, a motion to receive. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director Hiltz, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, a, a question actually for, for, for staff is um, um, in terms of the comments that are received back for APC, um, I, I looked in, in the Roberts Creek at one point, they said uh, it wasn't by consensus. So I'm, I'm looking, how, how do staff view the recommendations that come from the APCs as consensus? Or are they, I just like a little bit of background on how they receive it in their planning process. Like how, I, yeah. I'm confused. Mr. Hall? 
Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, so advisory planning commissions are um, managed using the same SCRD procedures as, as other committees, including the committee assembled here today. And so uh, uh, staff work with our uh, recording secretaries for the advisory planning commissions to try to have consistent standards in record keeping and decision making. And um, so would generally we <laughs> staff look at the decision that was made and um, may of course consider the supporting detail but rely on the decision as, as recorded. And it, it's a process of continuous support and, and dialogue with those uh, with those commissions to ensure that they have the, the most impact that they can and we make the best use of our volunteers' time while also ensuring we have um, good decision-making processes and decision-making inputs. Thanks. Director Hilch? So, so a, fo a follow-up. So when, when I'm at the APCs, the, the recording secretary also often asks for as well as a recommendation supporting points of view. So is, is more better than kind of like, sure, that's fine, more specific detail in the, in the recommendations? And is it consensus? Is it everyone? Uh, like I'm wondering, because there seems to be a little bit of confusion about how the APC should phrase the recommendation in terms of all of our support. Mr. Hall? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so staff would comment that part of that ongoing support to you and dialogue with our um, APCs is an opportunity to check in on processes. And so if directors are finding that their APCs have questions or um, would benefit from support uh, to help ensure that they are indeed having the most impact, staff would be happy to have that as a, a follow-up uh, uh, action or conversation with with those commissions. Thanks. Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, just for clarity here, um, I know in C Shout recommendations will come forward from our APC, um, but it's up to council to action them or could we just take their information under advisement? It doesn't necessarily mean that that becomes policy. Mm -hmm. It's information that's come forward for um, just for the board to garner the views out in the public. They don't actually have any uh, legislative weight mm -hmm. as they are. So I believe that's the same here. Director Pratt. Um, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Director Seekers. This is uh, part of our conversation yesterday that we had at, a, uh, at agenda review yeah. is, um, is around the recommendations that do come from APCs, especially um, uh, as some of them may say that SCRD policy should be that. And so um, so there's a couple of reasons for wanting to make sure that there, um, the recommendations, if it is something we want to take under advisement, um, if we want, if there's something that we would like staff to follow up on, it's important to make it actionable. And if it's just coming through any one of our advisory committees, whether or not it is transportation, whether or not it's policing, we need to make sure it's actionable. So bringing it forward at the committee, like we've been, um, we've been very conscious of doing that today. So, um, yeah, we want to make sure it's actionable, and then that way staff also knows it's something to follow through on. So I see no recommendations arriving from the um, uh, Annex Q. Any um, any further discussion? Okay. We'll move on then to um, R on our agenda, uh, Annex R, item 21, and this is uh, uh, the uh, letter of invitation from West House Sound from, uh, for the West House Sound Community Forum, uh, 25th. Uh, move receipt. Moved, seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? I believe the municipality got a similar invitation and. I do plan to attend, and I believe that uh, Councilor Dean Drag will be attending as well. So, Director Pratt? Uh, if any of the directors would like to attend, um, they uh, we would need a motion uh, regarding uh, expenses and remuneration. Okay. So we'll make a motion that any directors intending to uh, attend the forum be authorized uh, for expenses. 
Can you move? And, remun and remuneration? Yeah. 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 And, rem and remuneration for the meeting and expenses. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. And I think they're looking for an RSVP on this, if I'm not mistaken. Just uh, for numbers. I, I, I know I did, but. Uh, yeah. And item S is uh, for receipt and just to. Um, uh, for information, and this is the uh, letter from the Green Communities Committee, and um, and just acknowledging the fine work that the uh, SCRD is doing. Move receipt. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Okay, any discussion? Director Hills. Uh, sure. Thanks, Mr. I was just wondering. Uh, um, uh, I like the recognition. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it was for um, in terms of uh, like greenhouse gas emissions, like corporate reductions. And um, uh, I think this ties in with the CARIP report. And yeah. um, but I, I don't know if we had actually seen uh, the, the reductions from o over like a trend in terms of what the corporate emissions have, what they were like in 2013, what they are now. And, and so I'm, I'm just yeah. have we received anything like that so far? Yeah. Um, who would like to who would like to respond to that? Do we? I'm not sure that we received the CARIB report at the council table. Do we? Did we? Okay. All right. Yeah. Director Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, staff, do you report on emission uh, reporting updates uh, through the Planning and Community Development Departmental yeah. quarterly reports? Um, okay. But I don't believe that a long-term trend has been reported. It, it tends to be more year over year. Thank you. Perhaps in the next quarterly at, uh, or in the future, the end of the uh, end of the year report that could be done next time you're doing that assessment. Thank you. And item T is the letter from um, a joint letter from the mayor of Squamish and the mayor of Tofino regarding uh, joint submission regarding. Plastics, first of all, move receipt. Moved, seconded, all in favor? Thank you, discussion? Yeah, yeah. Director Pratt? Yes, um, uh, first off, I'm really happy to see the, um, uh, the joint letter from, from Squamish and Tofino, and I would like to see the SCRD um, put forward their support behind this, so, um, so the motion would be that the SCRD supports, uh, the SCRD board supports and wishes to join the submission from the districts of Squamish and Tofino in response to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategies proposed amendments to the recycling regulation of the Environmental Management Act and that this be forwarded to the September 12th board meeting. Okay. Uh, do I have, first of all, do I have a seconder? Seconded uh, for discussion. Director Hiltz? Um, I was just referring to the letter, and so we're, you're asking for us to be signatories essentially to this. Correct. So I was just wondering about short and then just be signatories. Is that enough or and just briefness and vocabulary? I, I just, uh, honestly, I just copied and pasted the, the motion that they the had in the, in the letter, yeah. which is yeah. just yeah, the same thing. Uh, it yeah. is uh, uh, it is page 162. Yeah, sorry. 162 uh, about uh, in the second half of the page. Yeah, the resolution is shown there. Yeah, the resolution is shown yeah. there. And just for the sorry, board's no, information. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, this will be on the Gibson's Council agenda as well for this coming Tuesday night to uh, the similar recommendation to endorse. So. so we have a recommendation. We have a resolution. All in favor? Oh, sorry, uh, Remco. The question is, do you want this to go to the board this afternoon? Yes, this afternoon. afternoon. Yeah, part of the resolution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. And uh, I think we should also, uh, when you bump into the mayor of Squamish, the mayor of Tofino at UBCM, thank them for their initiative. Uh, so. And. Um, Finally, I think finally on this agenda, yes, thank goodness, um, we have a um, paper from uh, Karen, oh, nope, sorry, other, other page, Ministry of Agriculture discussion paper to solicit feedback from local government about Class D licenses. 
And first of all, motion to receive. Move, seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And discussion. Director McMahon. Uh, I forwarded yesterday a letter from Raquel Koloff of the Sunshine Coast Farmers Institute requesting us to send uh, a letter uh, to the province uh, about the Class uh, DE licensing program. Right now, uh, meat that is slaughtered under those licenses can only be sold within the SCRD. Opening the boundaries so that it could be uh, sold in Metro Vancouver would be considerable benefit to local farmers because it expands their potential market. So they would like us to support that. Um, I forwarded her letter. Unfortunately, we have to do the letter today because we don't have another board meeting before the end of September. Aha! Director Hall. Mr. Hall. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. In terms of process, um, uh, staff have placed this item on, or intend to place this item on the Agricultural Advisory Committee meeting, which will be uh, occurring, um, I believe, next week, um, and have secured a short extension from the province to respond. And so would suggest as a process that, uh, along with the correspondence received, the comments of the Agricultural Advisory Committee can form the basis of a, a short staff report to be brought to the October Planning Committee meeting, advanced to the board, and then submitted yeah. to the province within their deadline. Okay, so, so this has been action by staff. Uh, do we need a motion to refer this to the Advisory Planning Committee then? Agricultural Advisory Planning Committee? Uh, no, uh, Chair, staff took that initiative. Okay. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, I see no further business right now. The, the, we, yeah. Oh, new business. I'm sorry, we do have new business. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and then I have a question about the in-camera. So that uh, new business, um, Bylaw 310 update has been requested. Somebody be able to provide an update on Bylaw 310? Uh, the, um, the review of Zoning Bylaw 310 is a priority file for the Planning and Development Division. And staff are now working on drafting concepts based on the input received through the public participation phases so far. Information sharing and coordinating conversations are also beginning with member mun municipalities, uh, most notably with the District of Seashell. And uh, focus groups on a draft for first reading are planned for the coming quarter. And staff would note that uh, staff vacancies are a factor in timing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that report. And then that report on short-term rentals update. They're all part, all part and parcel of that, uh, 310. Uh, thank you, Chair. They are, they are separate processes with sep separate process uh, steps occurring, but again, another priority file. Um, and uh, staff are pleased with the, the volume and quality of input received at the public hearing and are working on a report now. Um, Again, anticipated for a committee meeting uh, as soon as possible, targeting October. And again, staff vacancies are a factor in timing. Okay. And Director Pratt, you had asked for a report or a letter to municipal, municipal partners with single-use plastics. Uh, yes. Um, this, um, uh, in regards to uh, some of the, uh, uh, with the uh, feedback process um, for the, um, Plastics, having the conversations with uh, MLA Malcolmson uh, this summer. Um, there's, uh, um, and I missed, and unfortunately having missed the, the conversation around single-use plastics that we did have here in June. Um, I would like to, so I do have a full motion written out that I will read. Whereas regional districts cannot pursue a ban on single-use plastics and packaging as such action is outside of the SCRD's legislative authority. However, the SCRD can advocate for reduction in single-use plastics and packaging and that our landfill is reaching the end of its life cycle and reduction of all waste items is crucial for extending this as we have not reached 100% diversion. And further that the financial burden borne by the SCRD is growing and we cannot wait for the provincial and federal governments to write policy on single-use plastics and packaging. 
that the board write letters to our member municipalities requesting that they ban single-use plastics and packaging within their municipality. Do you move that? I would like to move that. Do you have a seconder? Seconded? Um, discussion? And, and just to speak to that, I know Gibson's is in the process. Yes. It has been discussing it. Um, Seashell hasn't brought anything forward yet. Um, and I know there was noise from the feds. There's been noise from the mm -hmm. province. Nothing's moving fast enough. We've got dire. Um, we, we're in, we can't do anything here at the SCRD. We're 6.9 years from landfill capacity. Um, where our diversion rates are not there. I mean, most of this is said in the motion. Um, and uh, I had also, I, I didn't read it out, but uh, I was going to ask that this recommendation be moved to today's meeting, is, today's uh, board meeting as well. You've got, you've got the recommendation. I've got everything here. So I can give it to Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. It's on the bottom of the page. Yeah, okay. Um, it is? <laughs> yeah. okay. If you can read. <laughs> All right. So it's been moved and seconded. And uh, for the discussion, Director Hills. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Chair Beamish. It's a question about the, the single-use plastics and the court challenge with with the bags in Victoria. Yeah. Is there do these things come together somehow? Yeah. Um, a lot of the reason why, or the main reason why Victoria's ban was, or the appeal of Victoria's ban has failed, or uh, is because they were using an environmental reason. Sticking with our landfill capacity and the financial burden, then that gives that not only gives us it gives the municipalities yeah. strength, and because we're the ones that are the service providers for the landfill, and, and we're asking our municipalities for financial and landfill reasons. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And um, okay. Yeah. And that that will certainly help our initiative as well, in Gibson. So, um, further discussion. Um, all those in favor? Okay, opposed? Seeing none. And if that is passed today, I'd like it to be forwarded also to the municipality. We'll discuss it on Tuesday. And, uh, okay, that being said, that's <laughs> been a lot for today. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's suddenly the little the little board meeting we had. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, the um, question I have right now is that uh, is we have a, we have to adjourn for in camera. We also have an in camera meeting this afternoon. Can we can we adjourn until this afternoon on this and then have an in camera meeting on the planning and development committee as well as the regular so that we actually have a break? Okay, so I do I would propose that. Um, do we need a resolution to that effect? Unless any of the items from this in camera might go to Yeah, to the CAO. As, as long as you specify the, the time when you're deferring this in camera meeting to. Okay. To come with, is it specific enough to say subsequent to the uh, oh. board meeting or? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, to, of today. Okay. To, to immediately follow the board meeting and, and board in camera or just the board meeting? Board meeting. To immediately follow the board meeting of uh, uh, September 12th. Okay. So that it's moved, seconded. Okay, all in favor? Okay. So then we will adjourn to that time, and, uh, but we also, at this point, will invite inquiries from the vast audience who we've managed to exhaust. That was my understanding. Giving them an opportunity. They may not come back with a covenant request, but at least they'll have a chance to talk about an alternative solution to the problem and, and, and give them a chance to do that and then come back to the board without disrupting the process further or having to start it all over again. 
so that would be the option. It would amend the process at that point in time, but it wouldn't uh, start all over again. Mr. Hall? Uh, thank you. So that, that, that definition is the standard that is used for capital A, capital H affordable housing. Staff are careful uh, when framing things as more affordable options to differentiate it from affordable housing. Generally, smaller lots, smaller houses, um, closer to transit and services provide more affordable options than some other alternatives. Okay, no further questions? Mr. Kroll, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.